clock. So we're gonna get started here. Okay. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm gonna call the meeting to order. Uh, the first thing to do is to uh, review and approve the agenda. I think we have some adjustments to make. Uh, so uh, the first thing is that we have a, an addendum. Um, there's an executive session uh, to talk about a, a, a property uh, along the bike path. Uh, and we're also going to talk about the, um, the pocket park um, as well. It's on, that's also on the bike path. Also an executive session? Also an executive session. Uh, so just a note about that. And Donna, yes. And I wanted to um, move an item. There's a group of individuals here to talk about State Street being closed for the farmer's market three weekends in May. And I'd like us to actually have a discussion about it. And if it could possibly be early in the agenda since they came thinking they would be in the early part, that would be good. Sure. So um, um, we could call that, uh, well, we could put it right after the consent agenda. Yeah, Part of closure. me wants to call that item four and a half. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay. But, uh, okay, so uh, any other adjustments to the schedule or to the agenda? Uh, okay, so um, uh, with no objection, we'll consider that approved. Um, so the consent agenda. So we're pulling, or so, do you want to? Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. I'm skipped general business. So uh, general business and appearances is a time for uh, members of the public to come speak to the council on any matter that is not on our agenda. For those here for the farmer's market, it just got put on the agenda. So yes. they're just And we would also ask that, um, in general, this is going to be true for the whole meeting, um, if you would uh, try to limit your comments to two minutes. Um, and we're going to um, we have some cards to help you know. Uh, Donna, what's the orange one for? That means one minute. And this two. is two. Two minutes. Sum it up. <laughs> OK, so, so just right to, here. to help you know. Yes. All right. So. Sir, and if you would uh, say your name and what street you're um, on. You can come to the table or you can go to the microphone. Either way is fine. Uh, Marie Spino, live on 6 Scribner Street, lived here for 22 years. Uh, just a few things and I'll talk as fast as I can. <laughs> 20 years ago, I asked for a crosswalk across Pioneer and River Street and I was point blank told that will give a very insincere and in just not comfortable feeling to give anybody security by putting a crosswalk there. I couldn't walk my three-year-old children across the street and this week when I went by Jolly there was a woman with a carriage, two young children trying to cross the street to get to Jolly. I think there should be crosswalk there. There is not one until we get all the way to the bridge. You're hurting businesses on the cross the street. Second of all, very discouraging to see people waiting for a bus standing out here in the winter when they've been told sometimes that we've got to get off in Barrie. At least you've got some place to go to. We should have, if it's temporary, cut the bloom and wind and rain. My Lord, people. The other thing, I think we should review the pilot program. I don't believe it's been looked at in probably 10 years. And the other thing, you know, we want to be a bicycle-friendly city, and I agree with that. However, how many times have you seen an adult taking children on the sidewalk, going in the wrong direction, and not even knowing what the rules are? I grew up in Barrie. We had to register our bike, pay $5. The police took an ID of your bicycle, so in case it got stolen, and you were handed a helmet and the rules. And that should be done again. Thank you. <laughs> and you did in two and I'll minutes. I'll stay here for the script there. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, I just wanted to say we, um, I'm hearing you and um, going to chew on all of those thoughts because I, I think that they're, they're they're worth thinking about. So I appreciate that. Question. Yes. Is there anything specific with the pilot program or something you and I could talk about? Separately? Certainly. I just didn't know if there was something in particular that you had a concern about. I don't know about. when the last time it's been reviewed. I brought it to our <coughs> legislators before, and they say, don't look at it, don't touch it, we got a good deal. We don't know. And yes, I will help Buzz Cirillo on the rec board. I was on the rec board 20 years ago, and I'll come back. 
I, I do have one other question for you, actually. You said the place where you would like a crosswalk. You said it really fast, and I didn't catch it. Right across the street from Jolly, the, well, the, the old... Um, I don't, I'm not sure. It's a Jolly store. store oh, yeah, I do know what you're talking about. Okay. All of the, you know, you've got a used clothing store there. You've got Hutton's. You've got children no. on the other side of the river that can't walk across that street okay. without an adult. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, any other... Okay. All right, so the consent agenda. Uh, yes, Rosie. So <coughs> I did not have time to read all the consent agenda items, so I would like to abstain from the consent agenda items unless it's needed to move forward. Okay, Rosie, fair enough. I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. I don't know. So I was admitting that I had not had time to read all of the consent agenda items, and so I would like to abstain from voting on them myself unless the vote is needed to move them forward. All right, thank you. Uh, Donna, did you, I guess we've... I'm going to pull H. Okay. <coughs> for discussion. Um, and we've sort of effectively pulled... Um, I guess we... Mm -hmm, I thought we had a... Never mind. <laughs> awesome. Great. Any other things people want to pull? Okay, I just want to make a comment, too, about the uh, investment policy. This is um, the addendum that's going to put the Montpelier Foundation funds in together with the city's investments. And I had pulled that from a previous agenda um, in hopes that we would have further conversation about um, some res uh, socially responsible investing practices. And uh, so I, I just want you all to know that I'm comfortable with this moving forward, adding in those funds for now. and. It's going to take a little more time to work out the socially responsible investing policy, but uh, but we're on it, and we I hope to be back um, with some recommendations for you all in uh, June. So just a, just a heads up for the timing on that. Um, okay, is there a motion? So second. All right, uh, we're all c we're clear on what we're voting on. I think so. Right, we pulled one item. Right? All right, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, so item four and a half, uh, the State Street Farmer's Market. So uh, Donna, do you wanna, do you wanna start with your, your comments and then we can invite the public up? Uh, yes. Sure. <coughs> well, several store owners have talked to me and unfortunately I didn't make the meeting that the Business Association had with the Farmer's Market Group, but I really wanted I got a sense that there hadn't been any, <coughs> many things had not been worked out well. And so I really wanted people to be able to speak and us to exchange ideas versus if you just made comments in the public, they just stand there on their own. So I would really like to share and see if we can't help make things work better for everybody. So I'm listening to your comments and seeing what we can do with them. Any other comments from the council at this point? All right, so uh, if you would like to, uh, any members of the public would like to come up and comment on this, that now's the time. You can say your name and uh, what street you're on. Uh, Karen Williams, I own Woodbury Mountain Toys. Uh, one of the, uh, actually what the thoughts I had was that you said that the market was um, for three weekends. We are under the, um, the assumption that it's for the entire summer, that it would be every single Saturday to be closed. Yeah, I was yes. going to jump in. So the council that, approved a summer right. long closure. I think what council member Bates was referring to Apparently, was going to be tried a certain with a certain set of. Yeah, but they have no parameters for that trial period. They just said, "Well, we'll just see." So there are no parameters in place. Well, to I understand. Do the I'm just trying to clarify. Exactly. Yeah. yeah so I, I was on. I, yeah. And, and so that was one of my questions. Was, that was my what are the what, what are the parameters that are involved in how they're going to make their decision? Uh, one of the things is they the configuration that they have shown us is with the tents facing the backs of the tents on the by the businesses so that the customers for farmers market would go down the middle of the street. And I know that the fire marshal has approved for the tents to be set up on the yellow line back to back. So therefore the, the customers that are at farmers market would also be um, this, the businesses on State Street would be included um, in the market and it would be more, um, more favorable to us. And one other thing that I would like to address or to, to say is that 
I have supported State Street closures because I know how viable and vibrant it makes it downtown. But it also causes sales to go down for my business. Saturdays are my busiest day. When streets are closed, I am down 15 to 30% for those days. If we were closed every single, or if the streets was closed every single Saturday from May to October, it would be detrimental to my business. So thank you. Nancy Martell from uh, Kona of Pinkies on State. And I'm going to reiterate a lot of what Karen said is when we have street closures on Saturdays, our business is down more than that. Ours is about 50% down. And to have that many closed during the summer, that's our summer business. Um, that would just be horrible for us. And if they have it the way that they're showing us now, it also blocks us off completely. We have no sun. We have, we'll see the backs of everything. And in order to get to our shop, you have to walk down one end of the street or to the other to come into Pinkies. Um, another concern and question um, is power. I know that somebody said they need power and stuff. Where is that power coming from and who pays for that power? I mean, we, we pay rent. We pay our taxes, we pay our employees, no matter if we're open or not. So who is splitting the bill for the power on that is a question. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Lesser. Uh, I manage Salam. State Street, and again, I'm definitely reiterating a lot of what has been said, but I guess maybe the more these things are said, the better, so they'll be heard at some point. Um, I just checked our numbers for one of those Saturdays from last summer, and we were down 25%, and I had to run over here because I didn't want to be late, but I'm assuming that the other days were pretty much in line with that because I remember it being way, way, way down, it was super noticeable. Saturday is also our busiest day of the week, so to be down 25% or more for every Saturday for almost half of the year would be really rough for us. I can't even imagine what that would do, actually. Um, and again, having the backs of everybody's tents to our stores, nobody's gonna come to our stores. It directs all of the traffic away from us for our whole street, and then when you leave the market, you've left our street. When it was in the lot, when you left the market, you came down our street, and I think we hopefully all saw, we saw extra business because of it, definitely, but last summer it was, everybody was leaving the market and then going to, probably back to their cars, but they definitely weren't coming into the businesses. The people that were wandering in were like, bored at their tents and just looking for something to do, but they weren't, they weren't shopping. So I would love to see if there's any other options if it has been approved for it to be down the center of the street with the fronts facing our stores, I think that would be no harm done to the farmer's market people, but definitely a huge benefit to us. And it's kind of about the downtown as a whole. So it seems like that would be helpful. Or in front of the state house might be better too. Or half on State Street, half on Langdon Street was mentioned. So just anything other than this is what I'm voting for. <laughs> I own Capital Kitchen on State Street. I'm a very nervous public speaker. So <laughs> oh, broke. Very preemptive well. apologies if things get weird up here. But I, <laughs> um, I just, I definitely want to just echo everything that my fellow business owners have said, and also talk a little bit about the process of how this all sort of happened. When the State Street was closed for the three-week kind of trial run last summer. Um, I was a fan, and I, I loved it, I, and I championed it to fellow business owners, to other community members. I kind of said, hey, this could be awesome, look how vibrant downtown is. However, that was a very different setup. That was down the center line, vendors back to back, looking into our stores. Um, and it wasn't until I read the first article in the Times Argus that I said, oh, uh-oh, that's not the configuration that's planned anymore. The plan is now 
as we said, lining the sidewalks, vendors facing in, their backs to our stores. Um, then I saw the map of what the layout was going to be, and I couldn't believe how bad my position is, Pinky's position is. We're in a box. Like, there's no entry to us from, once the, if, the, if the parklet happens for Positive Pie, which I've also been a champion of, um, <laughs> if that happens, I'm blocked from the crosswalk by Woodbury Mountain Toys all the way down beyond Botanica, like almost the whole block. You cannot get to me unless you go all the way around. And I just feel like my storefront is a huge part of my business. I feel like it's a big part of what I'm paying for, for rent, and I pay for rent 365 days a year, just like everybody else here does who owns a business in town. And I just feel like there's got to be a better solution. I, I do feel like we're all in this together, and we make the market better, the market makes downtown better. We're all working together toward the same goal, which is a vibrant, exciting, awesome downtown. So I'd love to explore other solutions, as Sarah said, that aren't this, because it's pretty terrible from where we're sitting. <laughs> thank right. you. Well, thank you. Anyone else? I just have a quick, this is Lauren Parker, um, owner of North Branch Cafe, and um, from my perspective it's more about looking at farmers markets in other places. I think everything that they've said is absolutely true and I support what's, what they're talking about, but also if you think about other farmers markets, when they are backs toward the businesses on the streets, it just doesn't look nice. It doesn't look open or friendly, it looks closed and boxy, and it's not at all welcoming to the community for the uh, retail and, and uh, restaurant owners. So um, from that perspective, just the visual on top of all the annoyances for business owners. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Okay. So uh, at this point, I guess I just want to, I'm going to uh, pick on you, Bill. So what, uh, so we, we um, approved this, the street closures um, already at, at this point. So what, Correct. where, how so do we... I may, I may have Sue jump in here. So I, you know, obviously I think we all just want what's going to work for everybody. So yes, the, this came to us last fall, winter. I think it had run through the various groups. And uh, at that point, the council approved the closure for the season. I'm not sure there was a specific layout that was part of it. There were other conti conditions layout. And I, as I understand it, Sue, jump in here at any time because she's really been the person on the ground for us. So in fact, like now would be a good time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Just Donna, to remind Bill, there was a discussion about the layout because I objected because they did change it and they said that was the layout they were going to use. And at that point, and we there still was a bit of a it. misunderstanding. Well, it wasn't a misunderstanding. The fire department prefers the layout along the edges with the backs to the businesses because it lets their trucks through. Now having said that, I've talked to the fire chief and he is comfortable going back, he's actually in the room, he <laughs> is comfortable going back to last year's layout. So in your approval of the initial layout, you were actually under a misperception to some degree. And the fire chief now says he, he can live with, he can get his fire trucks down with the old layout as well. Yes, Donna. Oh, uh, Bob? Chief, Fire Chief, sorry, I call you by your first name. But, I mean, one of the suggestions was also to, to break it up. Is nobody here from the farmer's market? Um, was to there isn't, and I actually okay. did let them know. There is talk about splitting this into two pieces and closing so, yeah. Langdon Street as well, so that one row could be on State Street and one row of farmers' vendors could be on Langdon. It would sort of be a circular foot pattern um, the farmer's market wasn't closed to that necessarily because they could do some things like music and, and workshops. They'd have more room. It hasn't really been discussed by them, and they haven't taken formal and, action. And it hasn't been discussed by our staff or by Langdon. That's correct. It hasn't been vetted yep. by anybody. So, so, so if we toss this at you and ask you to vet it, thinking that you could make more room for your fire trucks if we only had, like, one row, and they would be facing some of the storefronts and maybe not so centered, but over. Mm -hmm. that Is that, help? and you're thinking in Langdon Street also, mm -hmm. closing Langdon? Yeah, staff, we, we need to discuss that. I wouldn't do that on the fly. Public so. no. <laughs> Because now you've got two <laughs> streets closed. Yep. You've got State Street and Langdon Street closed every, I think it's 28 Saturdays. It's, 
I think that's what it is, it's 28 consecutive Saturdays. So no, that's what that, I asked. That's problematic. And so I think we should hear from the police chief and the public works director also. But it's, it's prob it's, it is problematic for me also. And Bob, maybe you could mention State Street. Because the, they had it talked about going in front of the State House, and there were concerns about that as well. There are. And again, those, <coughs> I prefer it there, but I know the police department would not because that's become very problematic because when you block State Street in front of the State House, cars coming off the interstate, you now have to stop them out at Memorial Drive because you can't let them turn left on the Bailey Street and get down the State Street and find the street close. So you really have to stop traffic out at Bailey and Memorial and keep traffic going that way. So that's what we have to do for July 3rd. Because otherwise the traffic will turn left on the Bailey, come down, now they're at State Street and they have no place to go. And likewise on State Street, if it were spread out so it was further like from Julio's all the way down, maybe not so thick, would that help with as far as trucks or anything that would have to go through? It emergency? would help fire, truck oh. fire vehicles, but it's okay. not going to help traffic, no, no. PD that has to control traffic. No, that, it's going to be problematic for that. I believe one of the one of the concerns and one of the reasons it's been successful or anything's been successful in that stretch of State, State Street is that the Elm Street turn is still open if you go. Okay. No, no, I was saying Julio is to the traffic light, just that that end. Right now, they, the farmer's market doesn't, has a, um, usually it, it allows a big space between Julio's and up across the bridge and then they start with their booths. Farmer's market? No, it went from the corner to Julio's. Basically, well, state to Elm. Okay. I mean, Maine to Elm. Maine to Elm, okay. right. And that's what okay. we, and, and I know that's what um, the police chief would prefer yep. for the exact reasons that the city manager is talking about. Mm -hmm. It gives Elm Street as a way traffic can come down, down. and continue yep. out. Where if it's up in front of the state house, you have to stop it much further up. So, um, one hypothesis is that the farmer's market uh, was proposing this other alternative configuration to accommodate uh, emergency vehicles. But if is, do we know that there was any other reason that they made this change to the layout? ADA? Uh, well, mostly they were concerned also about liability. They felt if they, when they face the sidewalks, there's a space mm -hmm. that people have to step off the curb to get into their vendor tents. And it's a, they're concerned it's a liability issue, uh, so they were worried about that. Whereas if they back up against the sidewalk and people are coming in the front, they don't have that issue. They were also concerned about unloading. The businesses did volunteer to help them with unloading. Um, last year's layout was a little bit complicated to get their their wares in, so that was their concern. So I guess I'm going to look at the council here as what you'd like to do. I mean, my inclination is to um, <coughs> actually recommend that we go with the old layout, but I'm curious for other thoughts. Yeah, Rosie. I'm not clear what say we have. I mean, we've allowed this organization to close the street, and I am trying to recall exactly what our motion was at that point because we may have made the motion that they could close it contingent on that configuration. And if so, we could take that back. But I'm not sure. I don't know what power we actually I have here. I could picture us like make a, making a recommendation to them um, to say, you know, could you go one way or the other? But yeah, I mean. A street closure is at the at the discretion of the city council, so presumably you could make a condition of the closure. But I, I don't have in front of us the actual motion that we passed, and we might be able to get it before the night's over. <laughs> um, but um, if there were conditions placed then, and whether that requires a reconsideration vote or that sort of thing procedurally, but presumably the council could. Um, when does when's the first one first happen? May 5th. May 5th, so that's really, that's quite soon. It's in January. Yeah, I think it was January 24th. Yeah, I think yeah. I have the agenda right oh, here. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yes, go ahead. If I could just say one more quick thing. Um, one of the frustrations that I'm having and that many of my fellow business owners are sharing with me, um, there has been a representative of the farmer's market, the manager, who has attended meetings um, Montpelier Business Association meetings with us since November and we've been quite straightforward about all of these concerns even before we saw the official mapped plan of it learning that they were going to be configured in this way we've really 
tried to be collaborative and shared these concerns in a very direct way, but now we're starting to feel like it's like, whoa, whoa, well, it's too late to do anything about it now. But they, it's been several months that we've voiced these, these concerns, so they've been quite aware of the issues that we've had with this from the beginning. I just wanted to make that clear. <laughs> I attended last year's RV antique collection and they were on the sides and people didn't have any problems or issues stepping off the sidewalk to go look at these nice RVs and I don't know if it helped or hurt your your businesses but I know it was great to walk down the main street look at things go around and then walk right into an, a business and it just seemed like I think that you know the fire could get through the middle they weren't really closing it all off and they left room for everyone, both businesses, pedestrians, and the RVs. Yes, I wasn't here last uh, time when this was taken up, but reading the email we got and uh, listening to the people who were here, I think it's a, a really legitimate concern. And I think that <clears throat> I'd like to see some way that we could make this uh, work for them. And I don't know whether that is to change the conditions in which the uh, closure was granted, but I would like to see us do something to make it work. I, I really don't, I haven't heard what legal advice anyone might have gotten about liability, but I don't, you know, the, the sidewalks and the curbs are there seven days a week, 365 days a year. I don't think the liability picture is a concern. I think it was actually accessibility. It was difficult for handicapped you know, wheelchairs and stuff to get down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was liability also. Yeah. Also liability, okay. <clears throat> Apparently they had an issue with liability where someone got hurt at the farmer's market a few years ago. So they've been through a court battle about this, which made them very sensitive about it. I, and I actually can't really speak too much more. I invited them to come here tonight, but. Uh, John. Just, just for reference because uh, we were wondering what the, the motion was. The motion just referenced the proposal, which was the attachment, uh, which was simply approved request to move Farmer's Market to State Street for, two, for 2018 season. The only addition was that it was contingent on discussions and approval with the de relevant department heads. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty broad. Okay. Uh, all right, well, so what do, what do you think, Donna? Well, I mean, I'm not sure how to to frame the motion, but I, I would I would like to make a really strong um, suggestion, if if not condition, that indeed one of the things was working with the stores. They've been meeting, but nothing has changed mm -hmm. since they presented it. They did a trial. The trial had everybody in the center, and that's what I expected them to to move towards. But they came wanting to change it, and I'd like them to go back to that which was tried, which did include the shops on the streets much more. Um, so, so I guess I'll t test it out here in the waters. I'll make a motion that we make it a condition that the farmer's market make an arrangement that works better for the stores and works with them for to the do so. For the first three weeks? I, I do for like the first the three weeks, sure. Because I, I do like the idea of like checking in, how's it yep. going, you know, okay. is this working? Um, yes. E with any can, any um, arrangement. So. And that's something we need to take into mind, not make such a broad um, time period without testing it out. And that uh, that's the other issue. So I know that we approved this request to move it. And I know that I know that there is a process by which the city council can revoke that. Not saying that that is what we're going to do here, but what I guess, I guess Bill, what would that look like? So if we're going to check in at three weeks and decide that, you know, if if it's not if the layout isn't going to change to, you know, what what we suggest, because I don't think we can amend our original since we've already moved. So what would that process be, Bill or John? I don't I know. I think well, I think you would obviously have to have it not just a, an add-on agenda item it would be certainly we'd yes. invite the farmers market invite interested parties and have a have a full discussion um, and you would certainly I think the first question that Karen raised is what are the what are the parameters what are the criteria that are being looked at and I think you might want to we might want to think about what would be 
causes for us to, uh, you know, I mean, a few people that don't like it, and I don't mean that disrespectfully, but is that cause to, to take away a permission that you've already granted? Uh, or is it, you know, demonstrated loss of business to the businesses, or is it, you know, just a, a poll? You know, how, how would we make that determination? It would be really important. Um, the other piece was that when, you know, really, I don't, whatever, it's fine with me. I don't have a strong feeling with the other how we do it, but when we did it, um, we, I think the council did get that the trial had been held in the fall, and, and there wasn't really a lot of opposition heard at that point. And we didn't really talk about the, the layout, but as I recall, for, you know, it was important to the market at least to, that it be for the season. I think the council, we're going to construction in that lot this summer. And so the idea was, you know, if they're going to be marketing there to tell people over there, they're going to brochures, this is where it is, but to change it in the middle of the which is not to say if it's causing harm, you still can't do it, but that was an important consideration. Okay. The basis of your prior decision as well. Procedurally, I'd have to look into it, but I think the worst case scenario is you might have to proceed it with a vote to suspend the rules, which would be a two-thirds majority. Okay. Um, but I'll check that. You might not even need to do that. Okay. And so I'm just just so I am procedurally clear because I don't I don't want to sort of run into a situation where we think we've done the thing to cure the defect and then it turns out we've made another defect. So it would be I realize so the farmers market start on the fifth, which is not this Saturday, but the coming Saturday. Would this mean that we would have to have a special meeting then to address this particular issue? That's what I'm hearing if we need to have an agenda item and we need to bring everyone to the table. Well, it depends what you want to do. I think if you're simply add, if you're simply adding a condition about how they set up in the street, I don't think you necessarily, you're not revoking the permission. Right. And it's area. just in addition to, it's like a Speak up in the area. area. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know, Mike's done it. Um, all I was saying was it would seem to me that if we were adding, simply adding a condition about how it was setting up, that that wouldn't necessarily require a special meeting. Now, they may wish to, they may ask for one, which would be their right, and I think, you know, appropriate. This was just added. There was no publicity given that this was going to be discussed, although the market was told that we were expecting people and it could come up, so that they, they were aware of that. Um, but um, I think if you're going to actually have in there a, a pro, you know a, a discussion of uh, taking back the approval, you know something stronger than that, then yes, I think you definitely would not want it. You'd want to have that beyond. Don't hear you. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'm t I'm trying to have, frame my thoughts, and uh, you know it's not a production studio. I'm sorry, Dave. Um, the, I think if you were to have a decision to revoke a per permission or create grounds for revoking a, a, a position, I would think you'd want to have a special meeting and invite people and duly warn it and follow all proper process. Like if you're simply adding a condition about where tents go, you could probably do that tonight because they could ask for a special meeting to reconsider it. And, and maybe this, maybe I'm just being overly cautious because being a lawyer like ruins everything and then you're like overthinking everything. Yep. But I, what I'm, what I'm afraid of is if we, if we offer a direction, a, a strong suggestion, I mean, I, I suppose there are a few different questions there. One, what if that's not taken? And, and then two, like, does, does that trigger some sort of other thing that is an issue? So my understanding is that the motion is not stronger just a strong language. suggestion, it's just language. it's a condition. So they have to do it. It's a condition. Yeah. That's if they go back to the setup that was done mm -hmm. in the trial yeah. in September. Mm -hmm. I would love to be wrapping this up real soon, okay. just so you know. <laughs> All right, yes. Well, I'm just wondering, since the original motion that we approved was contingent on them working with department heads, could we simply instruct the department heads to request that they direct that that in their deliberations um, they uh, request that the market come up with something that's more satisfactory to the businesses. That wouldn't be changing our original motion. It would just be giving our department heads some more instruction. If I can jump in, yeah, sure, strictly speaking, I'm a relevant department head since I yeah. manage the uh, 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 what am I trying to say? The vendors, which who I always have to sort of 
step up and defend in situations like this. So, um, you know, maybe that could be, if, if, if they've already talked to everybody, maybe the whole thing could be held up technically until I spoke to them and I could deliver that message. I'd be comfortable with that. Does that work for? I still think that the council ought to be clear on what they're asking for because, you know, we have gone through a process. We have encouraged them to speak. Uh, you know, Sue's tried to broker meetings between the, the farmer's market and downtown merchants. I mean, we've been very active trying to reach a, a conclusion. And, you know, in all fairness, I mean, the chief is being very gracious, but really in terms of purely a public safety response, what they're proposing is preferable. We can make work what's here. So I think the department has done their job and said, here's what we think works. Um, so we're happy to go back and be the bad guy or a good guy, whoever, depending <laughs> who's, <laughs> who's the mirror you're looking at. <laughs> but it would be great to have the council speak clearly if there's something that you want um, us to, to deliver. I mean, it seems to me that, you know, this is, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. If the council wants to add a condition, vote and add a condition. And, and it's done and it's, I mean, we'll still work with them, but. My motion wasn't seconded, was it, John? No, in oh, fact, okay. that's what I was talking about. Yeah. Strictly yeah. speaking, yes. uh, it needs to be dealt with as a second right away yeah. or it dies. Second. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Oh. <laughs> oh, were you, were you I was going to remake it. Was that on? I was going to uh, modify the language so that Bill was correct and Ashley's point to say that I, I want to make the setup a condition of them using State Street and that they will come back in three weeks time and keep us abreast of how it's working, both them and the store owners. Okay. Is there a second? A second. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. you're gonna have to restate that one, Don. Yeah, yeah. Just make it real short. <laughs> My motion is the condition of farmer's market using closure for State Street is that they go back to the setup they used in the trial so that they're facing the stores. And that replaces the other motion? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. And Jack is still seconding. Okay. And, and then you just said, and that they come. And, and that they come <coughs> back to us in, in three, month, weeks. three weeks, three weeks, as a follow-up of how it's working for them and the stores. Is that three weeks from now? Or three weeks from the start, or after three? After three, three weekends. Three, after three, three weekends, farmers markets? Three weekends. Okay. Uh, uh, David, I think, was next, and then Dan? Or unless, Dan, maybe you were. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, Dan Grover, Executive Director of Montpelier Live. Uh, at the meeting between the MBA and the Farmers Market, there was discussion of a four-week trial uh, due to the date of the next MBA meeting at the beginning of June. So um, I'm just offering that perhaps you can start four weeks instead of three. Donna? I'm willing to do that. Do you want it to be as an amendment, John? Jack, friendly I amendment. Think. Jack, are you okay with that? Oh, yeah, that's fine. I was thinking either the last, our second meeting in May or the first meeting in June, either one would be fine. But have it on the agenda now so that everyone affected knows. That's a without objection change. That's board. without objection change, yep. Uh, uh, David. Hi, I was here for different reasons, but my name is David Brownlee. And my wife owns Alavita, and I'm not here representing Alavita, but I just wanted the council to recognize that the State Street businesses are here year round, and the farmers market is here six months. That's all I have to say. Thank you, uh, Rosie. So I'm a little bit confused about this motion. Are we instructing them to change the setup for the? The first four weeks of the market, we're telling them they need to change their setup to what? they had last September and then no. check in with us no. or to use the setup that they're proposing for four weeks and then check in with us at that point and at that point we may instruct them to use a different setup if it's not working no, no it's directing them to use the setup they did during the trial which was facing the stores so the vendors have their backs to other vendors and are all facing the stores that and was what was done in the trial and that's what I'm asking to be a condition of them using State Street and you want them to do that for the first four weeks of the market? Um, uh, four, first four weeks. I, I, if I could, so what I heard was that, that we, 
could be wrong, so I, I'm asking clarifying questions. So what I understood was we were asking them to switch to that design with their backs to other vendors so they'd be facing businesses, and that after four weeks of that, they come back in and check. So that was for the duration of the permit to shut down State Street. They would come in and check in with everyone at four weeks, and then the direction would still be to continue unless there were other direction from the city. So are you saying your your is your motion to say that's only do I it said. this way? No, no, go back over. That's what I said. Okay. That's so my intention. So it would be for the duration of the farmer's market that's outdoors. So State Street would be shut down with the condition that the vendors have their backs to each other facing the businesses on State Street for the, for the duration of the farmer's market for the summer. Interesting, because that's not what I had understood. I thought the condition was just on the first four weeks. I thought the check-in was at the four-week mark, too. What's your intent? Yeah, well, they, I think the clarity from Ashley is important because they, they, I would rather them be able to plan that that's what they're going to do unless they run into problems and they mm -hmm. come back with us after okay. four weeks and then we change okay. it. Yep. But if it isn't changed, this, this is the setup. Okay. That's where the motion seems to work. Does that help clarify? Yeah, and I guess I'd like to just talk about that for a second because I, I'm really sympathetic to the businesses that have voiced their concerns, um, but I also know that there my understanding was that there were other businesses, and maybe I'm wrong because I did not attend the meetings, but there were other businesses that maybe felt differently. Um, and I also am really concerned about making this decision right now without checking in with the market. So I would be more comfortable actually letting them proceed with the current design for the first week or two, and then at a, you know, having a set check-in point. Because my understanding from the businesses was that you were really concerned that at this three-week check-in point, nothing would happen, that you, you didn't feel like you'd been heard this spring, and so you were concerned that we'd have this check-in and it would just continue on even if it was problematic. Um, so I would, I would prefer to give you some teeth to that check-in point and say at that point, if it's really not working and let's, let's make some criteria for what that is, then we will give strong direction that it needs to change rather than changing it on the fly like this for something that's happening two weeks but away. But it's not on the fly because we have expressed our concerns about this every single month that they show up at the meeting and we would like them to go down the yellow line back to back facing the stores and every time they come back with the configuration with the tents facing the backs of the tents facing the stores and all of their detritus and you know debris which is what is it's not it's just not acceptable to us so it's not on the fly there were no other businesses on State Street that were that I, I, I'm not really sure who you were speaking of that are the different businesses, but I mean I I name I can you know I know that I spoke with Lotus Day Spa. She said that please say that she is also um, against the configuration as you know it shows now. So is um, Botanica, Botanica, Botanica and, and Aramed and Willowan and yeah Alavita, um, uh, Cocoa Bean. Um, the, yeah, capital grant. Like, so it's, so I'm not really sure who my, I of, didn't so. speak with anyone directly. That was my understanding from, yeah. from city staff. So if that's not the case, then it's I may not, be completely yeah, in so the wrong there. Yeah, but so so I, it is, I, we don't want to do the, the setup with the tents and seeing the tents for three weeks and then come back. I would much rather change the configuration now and hopefully we, it would be in a positive manner and we can say like, yes, this does work, you know, as opposed to no, it's, yeah. So I, again, I'm, I'm concerned about making that change without having warned it. Um, and I, I would rather give teeth to a check-in point and say that, you know, these are our metrics and if it's not working, this is what we, and I, I hear you and I hear you that we haven't been helpful to you throughout this process in the spring and I apologize for that. Um, but I really am uncomfortable with us as a council having made a decision and then going back on it without any public notice um, at, you know, at such a short date. So um, that's, maybe I'm in the minority, that's my. <laughs> uh, yes, Donna. I, I would agree with that except it's Mother's Day and this is like Valentine's Day and what are the stores we're hearing from? Typical Mother's Day, the kitchen, <laughs> flowers, candy, jewelry. jewelry. I mean, uh, so it just, that's, that's what to me makes it so pressing. I mean, Mother's Day, Valentine's Day, Christmas, these are key times for our downtown stores. So that's my concern, Rosie. That's my concern. 
Well, team, I think we got to we got to move on. One last thing, okay. and then we got to we got to keep say, going. Uh, you know, once again, who's to define the metrics, and is it up to the store owners to report their negative sales from over what period of time, et cetera? Who's going to measure and define the metrics? Well, sir, I think we're just going to have to ask the farmers market to work with businesses to come up with. Uh, with those metrics. Wow. Yes. I'm concerned about that because it sounds like that's not working. That's right. right. They're not it hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. They should be here tonight. They, they've shown up in the past. They, they requested that we report actual sales figures to them, and none of us who are super comfortable doing that saying we'd work with percentages happily. Um, I thought you were giving me the orange card for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. um, like, Mother's Day is our second biggest, busiest time of the year after Christmas. Uh, Glenn. If we move forward with uh, Donna's motion, uh, Bill mentioned something about uh, the farmers market potentially being able to call a special meeting well, if they they could request. They, they can't could call. Only the mayor can call a special meeting. Uh, so uh, I want to just bring that out as a, a kind of uh, failsafe or or check, so that if we do this motion uh, and the farmers market is furious and has very good reasons for why it's a bad move, that is their <coughs> yeah. next recourse. Is that correct? Yeah. Correct. Uh, Connor? Can I just uh, ask the chief real quick, if we did go back to the original configuration for about four weeks there, are, are there any pressing safety concerns on your end? No, we, we can make that work. Certainly the center aisle is preferred for us, but we can make that work. Keeping in mind what um, we worry about the vehicle, the access, and we'll, Sue and I will have to get together with them to make sure we have the proper. Um, and then keep in mind that we will only, you know, we would not put a vehicle down there unless there was an incident down in there. We, if there's something on the other side, we'll go around. So the only reason would be for that. The other piece of it that we, and we'll work with this and, and the police chief, we're also concerned about the safety of the folks that are down in there. So we have to think about that also, you know, protecting the folks that are down in there. So that's, you know, <coughs> that's high on our list of priorities also. So if we're going to change it, we need to change it soon. We need to get together with, and start thinking about not only vehicle access, but how we're going to protect the people that are down in there. OK. Um, yes, Rosie. So I appreciate Glenn's point. And um, if we are willing as a group to, if the market really strongly objects or if we're hearing you know um, some strong objections to this that we would consider calling a special meeting um, then I would be willing to support Donna's mm -hmm. fine with me I mean yep. we can try to make something work okay um, no further discussion All right all in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed okay thank you thanks thank for you thank you yeah. thank yeah. you sure. uh, thanks for coming in all right um, I'm just going to make a prediction right now. I'm, I'm going to guess that we're going to be out at 9.40. 9.40. <laughs> <laughs> you can hold it too. I think that's our From time. executive <laughs> session? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> 10. Into executive <laughs> session at 9.30. OK. We're going to go into executive session at 9.40. That's my guess. Executive session. That would be good. One, one hopes. All right. OK. Um, Kate. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for Come waiting. On to the Barbara, <laughs> Kent, on to Carly, the agenda. Past item four and a half. So this is the Popular Energy Advisory Committee. Um, yes. Give us an, an update. Huh? So uh, uh, where'd Sue go? I, I will uh, let you all introduce yourselves. Um, she just disappeared. But I can't get into the computer because she needs a password. Hey, hey, Sue. Hey, Sue. <laughs> she out talking. She's out talking. <laughs> you want me to go again? Um, we can introduce ourselves, but the presentation part. <laughs> Are you on her computer? Is I, it on her computer? Yeah. yeah. I stuck it in there. So. They need your help doing the presentation. Put <laughs> 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 your password in. <laughs> so I'm Kate Stevenson. I'm the chair of the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. And you guys want to introduce yourselves? Uh, Jeff Fitzgerald. I'm member of the committee and I work on the municipal working group, municipal projects working group. Barbara Connery and I'm working on the energy planning group. And I'm uh, Carl Johnson and uh, I'm on the municipal group as well. Great. 
Um, so our goal here today is really just to, um, for the new members of council to introduce you to what we're doing on the energy committee, um, give you a little bit of an update and um, kind of talk through where we are um, relative to the city's net zero goals and kind of where we're headed and how we would like your support in all of those efforts. Um, press enter in the middle. Enter. Yeah. Okay. That's not Looks like fun now. It's filling the screen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There it is. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, just to get started, so our, um, and I guess I can't page through here, but um, we'll just scroll. Um, so, what does it mean for the city of Montpelier to be net zero? A net zero community is one that produces all of its required energy for. Um, for transportation, for electricity, and for heating our, our homes and buildings um, through renewable energy sources. And um, the goal of the advise, Energy Advisory Committee is basically to advise City Council on any energy related matters. Um, we have sort of taken a broader um, view of that task um, and we do a lot of outreach in the in the city to residents and business owners um, and as my fellow members alluded to we have four different working groups um, within the committee um, one that's focused on municipal operations buildings and um, one that's focused on transportation looking at alternative transit options electric vehicles bike and pedestrian issues um, one that's focused on planning and looking at the master plan, the zoning, um, our own city energy plan, and then we have a residential group really focused on homeowners and landlords. So that's how we organize ourselves. And just looking back at a couple of the projects that we've been um, focused on recently, this is background image is all the solar installations here in the city of Montpelier. But in 2016, we were really involved with the um, one megawatt of a municipal solar array um, that's half here in Montpelier and half in Sharon and organizing that for the city and the school district. Um, we also put together a workshop for landlords so they could learn about weatherization options and how they could reduce energy use in rental apartments. Um, we were part of something called the Georgetown Energy Prize. Um, which was a national competition of 50 cities from around the country um, trying to uh, reduce their energy use. So we were competing in that and uh, were named a semifinalist in 2016. Um, we also did a series of home tours of about 15 different houses around the city so that people could see different energy efficiency things in action. We had a transportation festival on the State House lawn looking at electric vehicles and other alternative transportation options. And uh, we won Energy Committee of the Year Award, so we're excited about that. Um, last year, we did a big weatherization campaign in the fall, the Button Up campaign, which was part uh, connected to Efficiency Vermont. Um, we did the retro commissioning process at the police department. And what that means is retro commissioning is something I'll talk a little bit about. But it's basically um, going into existing buildings and looking at their heating and uh, ventilation systems to just figure out how well they're working, are there opportunities for improvements, 
So it's really a way to go back into um, look at what we have and, and what we can do to, to make them better. So we did that at the police department. Um, we also did energy audits of six different municipal buildings at the end of last year. And um, another series of home tours. We worked a lot on the recommendations for the zoning update. Um, and we've been talking a lot with city staff on the ESG Organics to Energy project, which is still under discussion and I think you'll be hearing more about soon. So when we look ahead at 2018 and um, what's on our agenda, we're um, actively working on a draft of the city energy plan and that is in coordination with both the regional um, planning commission and part of the city's own master planning process. So we've, we've got a draft of that and we're still, uh, fine, still working on it. Fine tuning. <laughs> fine yeah. tuning. Um, we have three more retro commissioning projects um, lined up. We're going to be looking at the water plant. We're going to be looking at the um, district heat loop in the basement here of City Hall and at the fire station. So those are all um, projects that will be funded through Efficiency Vermont, so no cost to the city, um, and are planned to start in the next month or two. Um, and it's basically bringing in some, some outside engineers to spend a day really diving deep into how the systems are set up and giving us some recommendations. Um, we just finished up um, a big weatherization campaign called Weatherize Mount Pelier that you probably heard about. Um, we had about 150 homeowners from the city express interest in weatherizing their homes. And we worked with four different contractors here in the area to set up free walkthroughs and so that homeowners could get a proposal for energy efficiency work on their property. So we're in the process of following up with all those people and it was a really successful first, first crack at a campaign. Um, we're planning to do a campaign on modern wood heat this fall and really introducing people to the idea of um, super efficient pellet boilers and um, kind of automated wood heat. And as I said, we're still working on the ESG project and um, want to hear more about what they're up to. So in the big picture, we're trying to track how much energy the whole city of Montpelier is using. Um, and as you may have heard, the city's or the whole, this whole state's comprehensive energy plan calls for 90% renewables by 2050. That's the state's goal. Um, and so the, well, one of the tools that we use is called the Community Energy Dashboard, um, and it helps us track overall energy use. Um, but as you know, the city of Montpelier has set a goal of net zero by 2030, which is basically raising the bar and saying, we're going to do it 20 years faster and we're going to go 100%. Um, <laughs> so one, so we're, you know, we're looking both at the big picture of the whole city's energy use and then um, really diving deeper right now into the municipal energy use. Um, so the, our committee started tracking um, municipal energy use about, I don't know, four years ago, mm -hmm. I think is when Scott started. And this year was the first year that we kind of handed it from the committee to city staff. So Todd Preventure, the finance director, has, been, has taken over tracking all of the energy use, and I've been working with him um, really intensively over the last few months to try and pull all our numbers together. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of different pieces to this and a really big spreadsheet. So um, we, we're still kind of finalizing all of the data from, 20, from FY17 uh, and, and updating all of our numbers. But this, so I just want to throw, I'm not going to get into the details. And I think if you, you all have questions about some of the details of municipal energy use, Todd would be happy to come back and really dive into more. Um, but just as an overview, this gives you a, a sense of kind of when we look at all, um, both thermal and electricity, you know, where, where is our energy going? Um, uh, and it, you may not be able to see all the, the details here, but the wastewater treatment plant is a big chunk. Um, and then the schools are another big chunk, about a third of the total. But the good news is we are making progress towards our net zero goal. If we look at just overall fossil fuel use, you can see in this, um, the red line is propane and the green line is total oil. Uh, we've seen a real reduction in oil as we brought the district heat 
online um, and a couple other projects. So we are m making good reductions in our fossil fuel use. And we've also made some really good um, conversion to renewable energy sources when we look at our electricity portfolio. So if you compare 2011, we had about 2% renewable energy produced here um, for municipal use. Um, and now we're up to about 37% with the addition of the, the big one megawatt solar array. Um, with, with this slide, is, uh, it's 2% and 37% is, uh, is the number also getting lower? by means of conservation? Well, we're, we're getting there. Yeah, um, the other thing I wanted, yeah, I'll get to that, but um, the other thing I wanted to say is this is not taking into account the fact that Green Mountain Power's portfolio is also about 55% renewable. So we're trying to figure out how to incorporate that, that piece of data in. But this is just the city's own solar panels and what they're producing. Um, so this is... <laughs> getting to your next question. So like, how are we doing? Is it, are we conserving? Are we just using less energy? Um, we're, our vehicle fleet and the use of diesel and unleaded fuel has stayed pretty constant over the past um, eight years that we've been tracking. Um, our thermal load has gone down a bit, you can see, and our electric load has gone down as well. Um, it doesn't look like a, a huge change, but I think it was 14% reduction over the eight years. But, but that's a, it's a difficult question because there have been so many improvements, efficiency improvements, for instance, at the wastewater treatment facility. But while those improvements were made, they also tripled the amount of septage that they're processing. So the power requirements to generate that additional revenue for the city were exponentially greater, even though they're unbelievably more efficient than they were 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a good question, but it's, it's not one you can easily answer. Mm -hmm. And there are, I mean, for the most part, the portfolio has stayed the same, but there are some changes. If we compare FY11, you know, the senior center wasn't operating. So we added a whole building, um, which has pretty low energy use, but, um, you know, there are some things that have changed over the time. So this is just giving a sense of um, kind of how we've been able to increase the renewable portfolio. So. We brought in a small amount of wood pellets at the senior center. Um, we have the PV um, photovoltaic solar production. We have wood biomass, and that's all from district heat. Um, and then we have biogas that's being produced at the wastewater treatment facility and is used to heat the um, operations there, so to, to heat the digesters in the winter. Um, and that's, a, that's one of the things we're working on, how to, how to better um, track that. But, um, but we're up to about, you know, about a 20% um, renewable, renewably produced energy um, in the municipal portfolio. So um, now, kind of, so that's kind of looking backwards, you know, where have we come from? Um, looking forwards, what, what does it mean to get to zero, uh, to net zero? So when we're looking at electricity, um, our target is 30% reduction, so 30% from energy efficiency, um, and then whatever is remaining to re replace that with renewable electricity. Um, and so this, the dotted line that's going across the bottom here, that's the, the average annual production from the, the solar that we already have. Um, so it's basically showing that if we can reduce our usage by 30%, we'll be pretty darn close to being able to be 100% renewable on electricity. Um, so, and then that kind of, the division is between, the blue is municipal and the orange is from the school district. So we're, we're definitely within striking range on electricity um, if we can see 30% efficiency reduction. Can I just ask the Montpelier Roxbury the, the change in the school district, is that going to make your numbers a little more difficult to track, given that you've got another building that's yes. been part of the school district? hadn't even thought about that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not an immediate concern, but just yep. thinking about how we track this going forward. Yep, that's a, that's a good point. Um, so when we look at thermal efficiency, um, we're also targeting a 30% reduction in um, heating f fuels. 
Um, and that means basically we still have to replace 77,000 gallons a year of, of heating oil. You s we, we talked about how our use of fossil fuels has really gone down, but there's still a big chunk, right? 77,000 gallons of oil and 17,000 gallons of propane a year. So how are we going to do that? What are the options? Um, really, we're looking at switching to renewable fuels. And the three biggest users are the high school, the middle school, and the wastewater treatment plant. Um, I think we do have some great potential at the wastewater treatment plant to pr potentially produce more methane that could offset the rest of the oil. But um, we should be looking at, at some fuel switching for the, those two, for all the schools, but the, the two schools um, there. And we also want to follow through on the energy audits that we just did. And um, if we do a lot of the, the measures that they recommend around efficiency and envelope and air tightness, we have the potential to, to see some improvements there on the, the thermal side. But I think it's going to be, um, yeah, more around fuel switching on the thermal. And then transportation, um, it's, it's the real, the gorilla in the room in a lot of cases. Um, you know, our goal is to reduce vehicle miles traveled. And when we're talking about replacement, like currently we use about 20,000 gallons a year of unleaded fuel for city, again, municipal operations, and about 31,000 gallons of diesel. Um, so what are the options there? Um, looking at electric vehicles on our light duty fleet, um, looking at biofuels for our heavy trucks and equipment, um, looking at electric vehicle charging stations to support those electric vehicles, um, and just in, more in general, looking at how do we increase downtown housing to reduce commuting by car. So a couple of the things that, from the committee's perspective, that we think that the council should consider um, in terms of your agenda, we, we really see a need for um, city staff support to reach this net zero goal. Um, right now, you know, we, we don't have any staff representation on our committee. Um, and when we take on these projects like the energy audits or the retro commissioning or the tracking, um, there's not really a point person. <laughs> so we, we struggle with that a lot. And, and what we've seen is a number of cities that are similar to the size of Montpelier, like um, Hartford, Vermont, recently hired a full-time energy coordinator. Um, Lebanon, New Hampshire, recently hired a full-time person. South Burlington has someone within their planning department. Um, so we do see that, that there's a real potential for additional savings if there was dedicated staff. We have a really awesome, um, very motivated group of volunteers, but there's only so much that volunteers can do. Um, so other recommendations, we, we are still really encouraging pursuing the Organics to Energy pro project at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and there's details to be worked out, but we really want to try and see that um, work. Um, we want to follow up on the energy audit recommendations um, and really figure out how to work those projects into the capital improvement plan in the long term. Um, our short term plan is to use our new revolving loan fund to fund a number of smaller projects this year, about $20,000 worth of work. Um, but if we did all the projects that were recommended in the energy audits, it's about $400,000 worth of capital investment. Uh, but they do, it does have a, a return on investment for sure. Um, we'd like you to consider some policies around um, net requiring new, new construction in the city to be net zero. Um, it's for municipal buildings, but eventually for, for all new buildings. There's no way we're going to meet this goal if we keep building inefficient buildings. Um, and to start thinking about the conversion of the vehicle fleet. Um, it's really the municipal transportation piece is not one that we've spent a lot of time on so far, but it is um, something we need to be paying attention to. So that's basically it. Um, happy to take any questions, but I know time is, uh, is short. Are you this happy at all your meetings? Look at that picture. <laughs> <laughs> that's a neat picture. We are always happy. I'm always happy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great committee. Mm -hmm. yes. well, thank you. Hands on. I, I just want to make two small points. One is to really focus on, because it's going to be coming before you in a big way, the wastewater treatment facility. And we have not checked in with staff um, 
recently enough for me to even say anything more than obviously we want to work with what what their feelings are and and we're dedicated to that but this is a huge project and it's going to be a huge responsibility for you folks to make the decision as to which way to go there's a huge opportunity here and um, you just need to look from an energy point of view how much it means to city operations it's a third of city operations in terms of power um, and the other thing I just wanted to say and I know time is short but Retro commissioning isn't just a term, you know. The, the police station didn't know what the heck was going on with their power. And we brought in this CX associates to look at what was going on. And it didn't take very long for them to figure <laughs> what was going on. And it was a, a, you know, all you had to do was turn off a switch. And the power drain that was going on that no one could figure out was figured out. So there's real benefits to looking at these buildings in a comprehensive way, especially when you have a problem like the police station was having. But, you know, that, that, that's where these things lead ultimately is to savings for the city and, and more efficient operations. And also why it's really important that we're tracking because, um, you know, that issue was going on for two years before we kind of figured out what, what was going on and, and were able to fix the problem, so. so uh, Thanks. That was such like an accessible uh, presentation. Even a knucklehead like myself can understand it. So I really appreciate just the way you laid it out and everything. I worry about our partnership uh, with the state on some of this stuff. And you threw out the number. Uh, the goal is 90% renewables by 2050. And I'm wondering where that comes from. Is that like codified in statute? Is that a position of the administration? Because I feel like there's a lot of lip service when we're having like a moratorium on wind, essentially. You know, mm -hmm. and they're saying stuff like that. So. You know, where, where does that number come from? And it comes from the Comprehensive Energy Plan, and I think it has been codified in statute at this point. Okay. Thanks. Did you, did you look um, at geothermal? It, and would you please come up to the to the microphone to speak? I'm sorry. No, we're asking to you to come. I'm just asking you to come on up and. And speak from up here. <laughs> just curious if you looked at geothermal, and I'm disappointed that you use the solar panels. When I heard a statistic that in the three weeks that those solar panels were shut down, with the advent of Pilgrim closing and Yankee nuclear, those three weeks when they got no electricity to the grid, more fossil fuel was burnt than three months of the rest of the year. And I've got that statistic in writing. So I, I find that there's other sources. I know wind isn't popular, but geothermal is. Uh, yes, Rosie. No, I was just going to say that we need to have everyone who makes comments come up to the mic because there's the um, orca doesn't pick up the comments when they're not at the mic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I certainly want to look at all, all the options. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm excited, of course, to um, continue having <laughs> Uh, these conversations uh, moving forward. So, okay. yes. two quick comments. One, the energy audits have been great, and we really are working through them and are figuring out what needs to go into our funding plan for the buildings over the next year or two to try. We like we want to do all of it. Uh, so that's been great. And you mentioned the waste uh, water treatment plant. We are actually council's getting an update on May 9th. We know. Yep. Mm -hmm. We'll be back. We'll be, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be we'll here. We'll see you again. We'll be here. Great. All right, well, thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Hard you all work. Okay, so we're up to item six, tax increment financing. Thanks for being here. I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Okay, great. Good to see you all and some new faces. Um, 
Tonight, um, we are here to talk about TIFF. Uh, my name is Stephanie Hanley. I'm with White and Burke Real Estate Investment Advisors, and here with my colleague Gail Henderson King, also from White and Burke. And we're flanked by uh, you know her, <laughs> <laughs> Sue Allen, Assistant City Manager, and Peter. Peter Fairweather, Fairweather Consulting, here on behalf of the Mark Field Development Corporation. So, um, for the for the new councillors, it's nice to see you. And um, we are, uh, White and Burke has been hired by the city to look into the uh, tax and financing district to do a, oh yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> so make you see me less, that's good. Um, we have been hired by uh, the city to, we initially were hired to do due diligence to look into the feasibility of doing a tax increment financing district here. And then we were uh, authorized back in January to look into uh, the actual creation of the district and to go forward and present you with a TIF district plan and if authorized from there to take it on to the state. So we're back here today after several months of some work and to follow up on what we presented back in January. Um, and so we're going to run you through a little bit of backstory and some, some big picture stuff and uh, we're going to walk you through what is TIF and then we're going to drill down into the nuts and bolts of what we're proposing in this TIF district plan, we did send ahead the materials which included the narrative, the map, and some tables, um, which I'm sure you've read cover to cover, which is fine because there's you know <laughs> nothing like good reading when you're tired. And so um, we're going to hopefully give you the update and the, up, the big picture view so that when you get the, the revised materials, you can do a deeper dive. This is also a time that we want to present this for the public because um, there are a lot of components that are included in this. And so we want to make sure everyone's up to speed and has all the information um, before we come back before you in a couple of weeks. So we're starting with the why. And um, a, a pretty good quote to, to kick us off is, there are only two ways to influence human behavior. You can manipulate it or you can inspire it. Very few people or companies can articulate the why they do what they do. And that's Simon Sinek. And so we thought we start we, as in White and Burke, had come into this trying to understand why does the city want a TIF district and why do, what are the economic development goals and outcomes that the city is interested in doing. And so we like to start with that why because it really paints the picture of the vision. What we get down into the, the nitty gritty that we get into is TIF. And TIF is pretty grin, grain, granular, pretty gritty for lack of a better word. So we wanted, we like to keep thinking back to why are we doing any of this? Why do we need this tool? Um, the city had done lots of planning to get to this point. Um, years ago, 2016, the <coughs> city did an economic development strategic plan and it actually identified TIF as one of the tools to be used to help further some of the economic development goals. And last year, the city funded a lobbyist along with a lot of other municipalities around the state to get ta tax increment financing authorized again in the state house. So the new districts were authorized last year and Montpelier was one of the big advocates for it. So this is a continuation of that. Um, really the big takeaway from some of the strategic work that had been done that we understand is that Montpelier does not want to stagnate. Montpelier wants vitality and to not be left behind amongst the other towns around it, and it wants to be a thriving capital city. So how can TIF get us there? Well, we, we go from, from infrastructure and catalyzing private development. The, the idea being, if you can fix and create opportunities, how much more private development that you want could happen here. So uh, by investing in infrastructure improvements or fixing infrastructure problems, how can you leverage into development projects like uh, that have been talked about for years and years, like Savings Pasture, like the Capitol Plaza, like the Pit, um, getting those things really revitalized and into what you want and what your vision is for housing, retail, office space, and overall vitality. So that's the Montpelier picture. I'm going to turn it over to Gail to give some better, uh, some more description of what TIF can do and then what TIF is, and then we'll get back into the details of what we're proposing here in the TIF district plan. So there's several TIF districts throughout the state of Vermont, but one of the TIF districts that's really been fairly successful is St. Albans. And like Montpelier, St. Albans started off with creating a master plan and doing a series of studies and trying to figure out how they could revitalize their downtown. And 
after doing those studies, they decided to focus on one block in the core of their downtown, bordering onto Main Street and Lake Street, which is a pretty big um, area. The, the interior of this block has a, a, had a large uh, surface parking lot. A lot of the buildings were run down uh, or vacant and uh, having a lot of brownfield issues. Uh, private business just on the outskirts of the city, Milan Technologies, wanted to expand. They did not want to leave their current location, but they needed uh, additional uh, space to expand into. And one of the bordering properties was uh, state-owned, the state office building. So working with the state to uh, sell their building to Milan Technologies, the city worked to get the state to relocate that office building downtown into this uh, core block area. But in order to bring all those uh, employees there, they also needed to address the parking issue. They had infrastructure issues, and they also had brownfield issues. So this project would need to have a parking garage to be able to help uh, with the parking issues, the parking needs for the new state office building, as well as a future hotel, and also for the neighboring uh, businesses and, and uh, development in the area so that there could be additional par free up parking spaces uh, in the downtown. So this was a very complex uh, project to put together and involved a lot of different economic development tools, TIF being one of the uh, tools that was used here. And this resulted in the new state office building on the left, a four-story building, uh, with a new par city-owned parking garage uh, there in the middle uh, photo that actually has a connection to the state office building. And then the last part of the redevelopment for this block is the uh, hotel that was constructed and finally opened uh, the end of last year. St. Albans never thought they would be able to attract uh, a national chain hotel to their downtown, but they were able to do that and has been uh, successful so far. So this was a great, uh, a great start for their TIF district, and since then they've had other projects. But what is TIF? Um, tax incremental financing is a tool that's used for uh, incentivizing private development by being able to create public infrastructure that is needed for those projects that would not otherwise be able to work to get those projects to, to develop. Um, as I said, TIF is, is one of the tools in the toolbox. Um, so it's a way that a municipality can build public infrastructure that is needed for that private development and uses uh, tax increment revenue for financing that. So this little model that we have up here on the screen, um, a municipality will create a, a TIF district in an area where they want to encourage uh, private development, and but it, private development is not happening because there's needed infrastructure, required infrastructure in order for it to happen. Uh, so the municipality will establish that TIF district, then as projects come forward that need that private development, and need that public, uh, private development projects that come forward that need public uh, infrastructure, uh, a municipality will work with those, those uh, project developers and determine what is needed, how it'll benefit the development and encourage, incentivize the development to happen, the municipality will then take out a municipal bond for that public infrastructure. That public infrastructure then is built by the city, or, or in this case, the city. Um, then uh, once that public infrastructure is, is in place for that development, then the developments uh, go forward and are constructed. And then the increment of the taxes from that uh, development are then put into the TIF fund, which are used to repay the debt service on the municipal bond. So what, what, is, what is the tax increment? I, just, I didn't really explain this. So 
if a property is in a TIF district and today is assessed at a value of $1 million, when that property is redeveloped, expanded, and reassessed after it's developed, that property then is worth, say, $5 million, that increment of $4 million is what we're talking about the TIF funds, uh, that the, the tax revenues are based on that, that increment value. So the way TIF works is uh, once the district is established, all the properties within the district are assessed at their current, their original taxable value of what their value is today. And that value is set, that, that's the baseline for the district. All the taxes that are collected <coughs> for all the properties that exist in that district at the time it's created all go to where they go today, to the, all, to the state, uh, tax, state education fund and the municipality. Then any new development that is done, that increment that I just was referring to, uh, the value of that increment, the, the taxes from that development for the, the state, the funds that go to the state education fund, 30% of that will continue to go to, the, a minimum of 30% will continue to go to the state fund. And up to 70% can be used for uh, the TIF district. And for the municipal taxes, a minimum of 85% <coughs> must be used towards the TIF projects. So once those uh, public infrastructure projects our, uh, the bonds are taken out for those projects, they have a 20-year period to repay the debt service on those bonds. So the district will run for that period of time when those uh, various uh, bonds are held. And at the end of the TIF uh, district, when everything is all paid for up to those, that, that period of time, all of the taxes <coughs> from all the development in the district then will revert back to where it would normally go. So 100% of the taxes would go, for the state taxes would go to the state education fund and 100% would go to the town. So you've effectively grown your grand list. So jumping back to St. Albans for a minute, creating a TIF district plan is just that. It's a plan, it's a vision, it's the best estimate of what <coughs> could go happen within a TIF district based on what you know at that time. As the, as the projects come forward, things often change and will go in different ways. For St. Albans, their original projections within their TIF district plan was they would have 33 million in public infrastructure that would be financed through TIF and a resulting 87 point, I'm sorry, 89.7 million dollar increment of private investment within their, their district. Five years from when they started to today, they've invested 16 million in TIF bonding for public infrastructure projects, and the result has been $43 million in increased private, private investment property values within the district. So they've come a, a long way so far. They've got a great start. But again, it, changed, it wasn't exactly how they'd planned it, but it's, it's working and it's moving forward. So there's some frequently asked questions uh, that often come up uh, for property owners uh, within the district and outside of the district. And one of them is, does having a TIF district raise my taxes? A TIF district does not raise taxes. The only way taxes can be raised is either you have improved your property and the, the value of your property then is assessed higher or the municipality raises the tax rate and your value of your property, the, the, the taxes you pay on that value goes up. The other way is if you do a townwide reappraisal, <coughs> there could be a change. But TIF districts will not change the value, will not raise your taxes at all. Another question is, does having a TIF district take taxes away from the state education fund? No, it does not take taxes away from the education fund. You're actually creating new revenue, tax revenue, by building the infrastructure to get those development projects here. Without those infrastructure projects happening, that development would not happen, and therefore there would be no increase in the taxes 
for uh, the state education fund or the municipality. So what does this mean for Montpelier? Stephanie will take it away. So as you saw in your materials, but for the general public, we have spent some time then pulling together what, what could be a good TIF district plan for the city and what's reasonable with what expectations we have today, what we know about the, the, the projects and the barriers today. Um, again, this is just a, a, a menu of options, but we started here with the district boundary. It's a little tough to see, but um, what, you're look, what you're looking for is the blue. Uh, the blue is our TIF district. Uh, thank you. Good point. We have good point for just this reason. Love it. Um, so the blue is, is our TIF district, and the yellow is the designated downtown. The pink or red or purple is uh, the growth center boundary. The black is the town boundary. So what we try to look at in this is we build the district to be uh, fit within the criteria. One thing about TIF is that it's authorized by the state under the Vermont Economic Progress Council. So once we get city approved, once the city decides what it wants to do, then it has to get state approval. And some of the rules, a lot of why you see the things presented the way they are is because there's a lot of rules. And so one of them, it has to do with the boundary and where you can put your district. Because the important part of the program is to really incentivize it in growth areas where they want to see development happen but statewide. So they're incentivizing using a portion of the TIF, of the, the proceeds of the projects that you would otherwise send to the state, you get to keep to pay down <laughs> debt service. So we have the blue district. It, it is mostly within the designated downtown. It is entirely within the growth center. And Stephanie, their maps have the TIF district in yellow. Oh, so if you're looking it. at your map and wondering, the TIF right? district okay. is in yellow. Well, there is that. Oh, the one right in front of you, yes, yeah. that does have yellow. Yeah, the one in your packet, I think, was a different color. Yeah. Can I just uh, ask you to repeat that last statement that yes. the entire TIF district is within the growth center boundary? Yeah. Because it looks to me from this map that we're yeah. looking at. This is an old map that it bisects it here. Yes, yeah. There. It doesn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> the growth center line actually follows the entire property line of Sabin's Pasture. This is an, um, an old layer, I suppose. <coughs> Probably should have caught that. It's, I think it's right on this, actually, on this map. But okay. um, thank you for pointing that out because, well, because I want to update my materials for next time. Okay. <laughs> but they, uh, that was a, a question mark, is did it go with the zoning line or did it go with the property line? And the, it, the answer is it's with property line. But it is within, entirely within the growth center. It's mostly within the designated downtown, which was important to, to meet certain state criteria. So this one, which is what you have in front of you, it's pretty hard to read. So I'm not <laughs> expecting you to read it from where you're sitting. I'm going to use my laser pointer, but it is in front of you um, for the public. I apologize. So um, we have identified seven, um, sorry, six general buckets of infrastructure projects that are going to catalyze these eight private development projects. The six are divided up in some ways. You'll see in the materials um, some things are phased because they have to happen two different times. You know, you kind of do things like Barry Street um, you want to do in, um, in phases. But essentially, we've identified eight different projects. Starting out here on the eastern side, this is Sabin's Pasture. Sabin's has long been discussed as poss a great possible housing um, site right inside of the growth center. And the problem is the infrastructure along Barry Street is not sufficient to meet the demand. And again, what this goes back to, as Gail was to talk, talking about, is that when there's such an infrastructure burden on these projects, the market rates don't make it work to actually, what, what they can afford to charge for a house isn't going to pay for the infrastructure, public infrastructure that's needed in the right of way to actually serve their project. So it's incumbent on the city to upgrade that, and then it, takes, it makes the project more feasible. Otherwise, it would be done by now project would already be done by now if it was a if it was a if it penciled out so there's infrastructure along Barry Street um, road infrastructure utility infrastructure um, that could happen that would catalyze housing at this site again I use the word could a lot I use the word would a lot but we, because we don't know but that's been long discussed and that's been the identified infrastructure issue next to it is the site of the Vermont College of Fine Arts and the front part of that has been identified as a possible housing site Again, they struggle with not just the infrastructure along Barry Street, but also the intersection of Barry and Main Street. If you're putting a lot more cars through there to serve housing, that needs to be upgraded. Um, down along the river, there are a couple of granite sheds that have been, um, uh, you know, I guess, 
closing over the over the years along that area, but now they've been uh, targeted as possible sites for future housing and commercial space. Again, they rely on that infrastructure along Berry Street <coughs> to be upgraded. And how much of the infrastructure you do at certain times is, is completely dependent on that phasing. Um, coming up the street a little bit at that intersection, we have sited um, Capital Cleaners. Capital Cleaners is a great business, a great you know piece of property, but it's underdeveloped. It's a one-story building on a site. And one thing I should clarify, and you've seen in the plan, is that we do this in a, a tiered system. Tier one are the projects we are pretty sure would happen if you just put in the right infrastructure. Tier two projects are ones that have been talked about for a while. I would, um, you know, things that could happen if all these other projects came up and if there were other types of um, infrastructure available to them, but there's nobody at the door ready to make the project happen. Tier three is like capital cleaners. It's not that people have been talking about redeveloping it, but if that in intersection changes and is, is making it more viable <coughs> to do a multi-story building with capital cleaners on the first floor and upstairs residential or commercial, that becomes a much, but that could be 10 years out and we have to project, it's a 10 year projection that you're doing. So it's on the menu, we should say. And then you get into the core of downtown where um, along State Street, um, we have the, the pit, the long discussed pit, which um, is maybe prime for redevelopment. If you could put parking in there and upstairs you could put uh, retail or a residential and commercial. Um, but they need upgrades to, again, the utilities and some of the, and the transportation improvements there um, in order to make that happen. Uh, and then next to it would be the State and Governor Davis property, which is, we're calling it the State and Governor Davis just because that's the intersection, but it's the old gas station. And um, that's recently been purchased and is prime for redevelopment, but again, really relies on some additional um, infrastructure work with the access, the utilities, and they also need parking, desperately need parking. Now I've left the, I've gone, you've noticed I've gone backward um, because, oh, Christchurch. Christchurch is here as well. That's affordable housing project that I know has been <coughs> discussed publicly a lot. And um, again, they need parking in order to make that feasible, especially housing always needs parking because they, they really have to be parked units. And then we have Capital Plaza, which has been long discussed as having um, expansion potential, but they keep running into the barrier of structured parking. Structured parking is around $28,000 a space, not including contingency cost, so it's very costly and it adds quite a lot to the, the ticket that when you're already doing downtown development, which is costly because of um, infrastructure and you have to do different types of shipping materials in, you don't have a big green space to do your staging and everything, um, adding that cost has become a big barrier, which is why they haven't been able to proceed yet. They have a contract, they're hoping to go forward, but they've been working closely with the city to look at different configurations of what they could contribute and what the city could contribute to do a garage that would be both <coughs> public parking and private parking for their use, but how else could it be leveraged to use for other private users, for Christ Church, for maybe incentivizing other developments in the area to provide them with parking. That, all of those expectations and all of those configurations are not set in stone by this plan by any means. This plan is purely a, just that, a plan. It is a, uh, a menu of options and it is doing the due diligence to set up the city for using this tool. How you end up using the tool, investing in that parking garage or not, is up to you. Once you have the tool, it's up to you. But you have to put some expectations in writing and present that to the state and show that you've done the due diligence in order to get approval for the tool. And then, as negotiations proceed with all of these property owners to do a public-private partnership, then you have the plan in front of you, and if it, it and if it meets with the intent of what you're trying to do, you'll have authorization to use TIF. So this is not binding. I make that very clear because there's parallel paths of the city working entrepreneurially with different partners all over the city, and this is ir is irrespective of that. It's really setting up the tool. Excuse me. Yeah. You, you just said, said something that I'm not sure I understood. You said you then have authorization to use the, to do the TIF. Does that mean that uh, even if we go forward with uh, creating the TIF district, that there's some state review of the individual uh, TIF investments? That's a great question. It's, um, and sadly, there's no real clear, bright line. If you, if, if you follow exactly, which it never happens that way, exactly as we've projected here that you do this much investment and you bond for this much, um, you don't have to go back to the state at all. It's just 
carte blanche. If you vary a little bit within that, and there's no real clear, clear bright standard and bar of what that is, you don't have to get approval. But basically, as you're doing projects, you're communicating with the state consistently. And it, the big thing is to stay within intent. So if you intend to do parking, you've said that in your plan, and then you do a parking structure, you've pretty, pretty you know, and you meet within the location criteria and nexus and all these other tests, but you've proven that, then you're pretty much authorized to go. It's if you vary widely from what you've planned, if you, if you start to include a, pro a project that wasn't on this list, for example, um, then you go back for authorization, and how much authorization, if it requires a full board meeting or not, is again subjective. And that's to VEPSI? Yeah. But, yeah. but also, I guess just to balance that answer, when you go to the project, let's say you get your TIP approved and you go to the projects, because they're in there as a maybe, you're not obligated to do them. Right. You look at each yes. project yes. once you have the TIF and decide what you want to do, and each yep. gets reviewed and yep. bonded. Yes? Yes, and actually, as an example, in St. Albans, um, there were several that were on the list that they've done. There's a few they haven't touched at all that they may not do at all, and then there's one they just did that wasn't on the list. And they, got, they went back and got approval for that. So or they told, it was actually more of a reporting even. They just reported to the council that that's what they were doing. So, sorry it's not a more clear answer. But, but also <coughs> as projects, as public infrastructure projects are getting ready to move forward, we are working with the private developer to make sure that they are going to do their project. When you're ready to, to do that public infrastructure project, you do have to go to a public vote. So there is a vote. That's when it's binding. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so the nuts, that, those are kind of the nuts and bolts of what we've, we've included in the plan. If everything happened exactly as we planned, because that's <laughs> always what happens, uh, we, we could expect to see $7.8 million of pu pu public infrastructure leveraging close to 66.5 million of private property value incre increase. That's just the increase of value. The new taxes on that, again, just to go back to the TIF 101, it's the taxes that would go from the 66.5 to pay down the debt service for that 7.8 million. And then you've got a grand list that has grown by almost 70 million at the end of 20 years, and that all of that is gonna come off and, and feed your general fund. Um, we do a lot of modeling, so what I need to take a sidestep and say is the process, and I'm, I'm jumping ahead in my own notes, but because I'm warning you about what you're gonna see in a couple weeks when we bring back a final version, which is a lot of tables. And that's what we've used as the model to, to go through this. It's what the state gives you a template and you build it and you build the model. So we have to provide that as part of the TIP district plan. It's pretty overwhelming. I think I gave you plenty of tables with a little cheat sheet um, because it's pretty overwhelming. But this is, those, this is where those numbers come from. So let me go into um, really quickly. <laughs> I hope everyone gets this reference. I'm a little <laughs> worried. But um, the enough. really important part is that TIF, this, this TIF program, the one that's currently authorized, and the way we're building the district is not an if you build it, they will come model. You do not want to build infrastructure in a way that is speculative and hopeful that the private development will come. As Gail said, you work closely, public and private sector, as, as a team to create development agreements that really hold the private developer accountable so that you know you'll pay down that debt service using their TIF revenue. And the point of that is that the reason, that's why we go through all these exercises of doing all the modeling, we do sensitivity analyses. Well, if this project didn't happen, could they still pay the debt service? Because you don't wanna get stuck on the hook for infrastructure you've built and no private development came. Um, Essentially, <coughs> the other piece of the program, the, the real important part of the program is not to just be doing infrastructure for infrastructure's sake. You're not doing deferred maintenance. This is, in, the tool is meant for economic development. It is to help the council fulfill its economic development goals that the city has set forth. And so when you have a, a district, once you have the district, the point is to work really closely with your private developers who are at the table, who are willing to invest and treat them as a partner because you want, you do not want to do anything speculatively. 
you want to build it in lockstep, knowing that they're going to invest and raise their property value and pay those increased taxes that are going to help pay down that debt service for that infrastructure piece. Meanwhile, the rule insists that the, pub that the infrastructure remain public, so it has a public benefit, but the point is to incentivize economic development. So I wanted to emphasize that. Um, Can I ask, um, yeah. so you're saying, you know, this is not to, to maintain current infrastructure, and that made me think about um, how, in your formulas, how do you account for the new added maintenance that the city is going to have of the new infrastructure that we build? Is that taken into account, or is, do we need to take that out of the increased general fund revenue that we're expecting? Yep. It's, it's an, it is um, capital cost only. Okay. So that's, when we see, oh, we're going to have, you know, this much more in our general fund to do all these other great things Later, with, yeah. we really have to remember to yep. take into consideration yep. that we're also going to now be maintaining this other. Right. And the hope is that um, you've gotten, um, you know, you're, you're, you're improving and, in, and increasing, you know, your, your sewer lines down Barry Street and that your, your fund is actually, eventually you were going to have to replace those anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, the idea being you're going to increase them now, you're going to invest in them now. It's maybe a, an accelerated timeline than you intended, right. and it was all, you're also going to expand them, which will have other benefits as well. But the idea is it's not only for deferred maintenance, I guess. Is one of the so things. for city staff, there were some things in there, like I saw there was a traffic light suggested to be added at one intersection and that kind of thing. It would be really helpful if you could give us some sort of ballpark numbers about if we were to build this infrastructure, what that added ongoing maintenance for the new things, not for the, you know, I understand we're hopeful that we can right. eliminate some <laughs> yeah. other maintenance headaches, but um, for those new things, that would be useful going forward. Yeah, and looking at something like a parking garage where you want to look at, um, that one's a big one when it comes to maintenance, right. is, um, is adding that maintenance cost in when you do the actual model so you see what the parking revenues will do. Usually the parking revenues are what you use to pay down that maintenance cost so that it doesn't impact your general fund, your existing general fund. Um, I will say this is a real technicality, but I'll, I'll, I'll throw it in there just to confuse you. Um, <laughs> well you can actually retain less than 100, you can use less than 100% of your municipal increment to go into the tax increment financing district. And some municipalities have chosen to do that. They, you can um, take, allocate less, almost uh, no less than 80%. So you could have 20% go into your general fund of the increment, and 80% go to the TIF, the TIF fund. Um, concept, conceptually, that's fine. With these numbers, it doesn't work because in your early years, you don't have enough cash flow to pay your, your debt service that way. Um, the, the, and so some municipalities, though, have enough because they're not front-loading their district that they could use that 20% to be paying into the general fund and kind of offset some of that. That being said, you will see in the model, if I don't know if it was one of the tables I showed you, you actually have a huge amount of surplus in like year 10 or 11. So you can actually at that point ratchet it down to retain less than 100% and a, a portion of that increment can start going to your general fund earlier. Is that way too much detail? That's real nerdy. I no, that, that's actually that's helpful because I, I think that this is making me realize that we may end up having taking a property tax hit in those early years and I, I want to tease that out a little bit more yeah you um, might want to look at that with each individual project see what it will cost to to maintain that because you're not going to do all of them at the same time anyway so maybe picking which ones you do um, I will say you'll see in the cash flow projections that some of the early years have a negative cash flow we talked about that at the last meeting but um, that's done in every municipality you do interfund loaning you don't take that money from the general fund and eventually it gets repaid because you don't want too many of those years like by year six or seven it's back surplus and you've already repaid those so um, I'm gonna keep going real quick and we'll come back for more questions because I know there's there's plenty more but I want to get through this last few pieces which is process um, <clears throat> this is a complicated process the, the binders in the middle that you see are what go to Pepsi there's a ton of, of paperwork and things that we have to do to, to really educate the state because they don't well in most county, most municipalities, they don't know your city. Well, they, their headquarters are here, but you, <laughs> they assuming they don't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so you know, you're educating them about what. But there's a story to tell here, and that's why we we wrote the TIF district plan the way we did. What's the truth about the growth in the capital? Because there is maybe a misno uh, uh, misconception that 
there's surplus. You guys are one of the thriving cities in the state, but there's also an increased demand on infrastructure here. So there's a story to tell that we need to make sure is very clear. So the TIF district plan you have in front of you tonight in very draft form um, is actually the nut at the, the heart of the BEPSI application. Then we build that, that application around it with all the other forms and materials that they need. And we submit that to the state and they do a series of hearings around that to, to review your application. <coughs> we have submitted the letter of intent following our last meeting. So the state knows we're intending to apply by the end of May uh, should this council choose to proceed. And so we would assume we'd have hearings over the course of the summer. And the reason we did that and timed it that way is so that you would have authorization if you so chose to go forward with any develop, uh, infrastructure project to make it to the November ballot. So that would be an option. Um, the draft you have in front of you is a very draft form. We understand there's probably a lot of edits and we've made, continued to make edits since we sent it to you on Friday. But the point is we, uh, we do it in this way so that you have a chance for input, not just you council, but you public and any concerned or interested stakeholder who wants to have input on what this plan means or has any questions. So we are going to leave this in draft state until Monday, April 30th. Um, we have, um, got this slide here. There's a website, a web page on the web city website for TIF and a contact information will be on there. So we have ample opportunity for people to, to submit um, any input they have but before Monday and then we're going to revise the plan with all of that input. We're going to take that into consideration and re, you know, rework what we need to or rerun the numbers if we have to and the hope is to submit then a new fresh final version of the TIF district plan back to you by um, in time for your May 9th meeting. And on that meet at that meeting, should you choose to proceed, you are actually authorizing and starting creating your TIF district. There's, it's by your vote that actually creates the district. You can't use the tool until you get state approval, but you've started the district <laughs> and you start the clock. So um, there's a specific resolution that's prepared by the state that would be put in front of you, presented in front of you, if you um, choose to go that way today. So um, that's the next step that we take. And after that, it's a whirlwind to get to the state application. Um, I think, you know, I, I guess I, I'll go to the Q&A slide for my own question. My question to the council and to the public would be, what have we missed? Is there anything we've missed? We've gotten input. We've, we're working closely with the core team, which has included a couple of counselors and um, partners. The MBC has been a big partner in get it, helping us gather data and gather assumptions. Um, and then, you know, we talked with a lot of stakeholders, local property owners, business owners, developers, and tried to get as much input as we can because we've been working at this since last July. Um, but we're always happy to take these, um, any input now. And then, you know, after we put together the final plan, there's still opportunity for input because the council can then choose to do projects as they wish with the tool after it's been authorized. How about I'm going to stop talking and open it up for questions? Like there's no burning questions. <laughs> All right, other people have been asking questions <laughs> along the way. Jack. I, I have a question. People who know me know I'm a very optimistic person, so I'm trying to kind of curb my enthusiasm <laughs> <laughs> and, and ask you to talk about what could go wrong. I love that question. What's, one. what's the one possible? That. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Sure, there's definitely risk here. So. Um, it's not a high risk, but it is ri there is risk. And the, the main point to remember is that as a partner in any endeavor like this, it is taking risk on to be entrepreneurial, to see through your vision. So there is some risk. And the, the main one being when you go to bond for a vote, or go to the vote for a bond, you're, you're taking on debt and you have to pay it no matter what. You have to pay the debt. Um, should the projects not proceed as planned, should they fail after five, 10 years and go out of business and the, the property loses value, if there's a fire and the property loses value, you're still on the hook for that debt service. That is a risk. Um, there's a lot of wording in the vote that goes to the voters that says that, that you, you know, so voters are aware that that's one of the risks. That being said, there's been a lot of things in the program that have been built in to help protect that, which is why you do not do a district on one property. You don't do one project district you do a whole district because the hope is that even if one doesn't perform as well as you'd hoped, 
other things have been catalyzed, other projects and properties have increased in value. You see some natural natural increase. Somebody in five years was already going to redevelop their property in five years. That still goes to help pay, pay debt service. So there's some barriers for, and it's a 20 year period. So it gives a little bit of a longer runway. Um, this is going to your next question that I know you have. Have any TIF districts failed in the state of Vermont? No, <laughs> they have not. Um, not yet. We haven't actually seen any finish. There's not a close to any districts yet. There is uh, one, one district in Colchester that actually folded and just said, we're not going to use the tool. They, t they turned it back in, which you don't really do, but they just never used it and just ended it. But none have finished for us to see if they've failed. Nationally, if you Google tips that fail, one of the best examples is a Walmart. Uh, example that, and I'm not even saying where it is or when it was, and there's probably several of them, but you know, it wanted to come, they wanted, the town wanted it to come so badly to an interchange that they offered to run all the utilities out to the interchange, and they thought as soon as that builds, all this other development will build around it, and it will help pay down that infrastructure debt. They built it, it didn't come. Now they're on the hook for water and sewer to nowhere. Those are failures. That's why the program, and um, there's been some studies done about why Vermont's program is better than a lot of other a lot of other states around the country because it builds in all these protections to make sure that you've worked on this in tandem with your property owners as best you can. But you're a partner. You're basically a partner in the development. I'm not going to skip. Um, and a little bit more in that direction. Uh, back to uh, Gail's slide, I think about. Um, uh, frequently asked questions, TIF does not raise your taxes. I understood that uh, as it stands. If TIF succeeds and for 20 years, it will not raise taxes. Am I correct that if TIF fails after 20 years, then taxes would have to go up in order to pay back the debt that was not successfully paid up? Does that? Mm -hmm. If, you, if yep. the municipality took out bonds for infrastructure and for whatever reasons the developments did not happen yep. or did not happen as planned and there's not enough revenue coming in, then the municipality would have to look at how to repay that and in that scenario they may have to raise taxes. But TIP right. itself yes. does not raise taxes. Having the tool, I would say yeah. And when we say if TIF fails, it's a little bit of a misnomer because it doesn't, the tool doesn't fail. Right. A project might not suffice, or t the TIP fund may not may not pencil out. Right. Yes, Josie. So you had a recommendation that we do bonding over thirty years, and that was because of cash flow yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. That makes me nervous because the time period for the TIP is only twenty years. Yes. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit yep. more about that? Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up because um, it is weird. <laughs> so <coughs> the TIP district life of a TIF district is actually as long as you still have debt. When you finish paying your last debt, that's when the district ends. You can only retain taxes for 20 years. So you can stockpile, squirrel away your, your revenue for 20 years, and then still have debt service. But the point is with that model where it shows cash flow, you just use from that pot to keep paying for those 10 more years. Realistically, that's the way the model's built, and it's so stupid. Of course you're going to pay it in a balloon payment at year 20. <laughs> if you have the money in your account, of course you're going to pay it all at one point, at one time. <clears throat> but you can use a tool that's longer and intentionally longer because it will reduce your, your, your annual debt service in those early years. Problem is, what it does is with debt, it gives you, you're paying more interest over the life of the loan. So if there's any way to avoid that, you want to try. And the way you could do that, and I put that in the thing is to do a sinking fund instead. So if you borrow a little more than you need for the for the actual infrastructure, and you put that into a sinking fund to cover your debt service in those early years, you can do that, which they didn't say, oh, that's super helpful because then you don't go into a 30-year bond and pay a bunch of interest you don't need to pay. A little work around. <laughs> Very handy. Other questions? So, uh, we don't need to approve anything tonight. Nope. This is just an opportunity for us to gather information and to sort of take the temperature. How are we um, feeling about this? And um, so any any other questions or concerns? Um, yeah, yeah, Dan, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Dan Groberg, Montpelier Live. Um, I sent a letter of support to Mayor Watson, and I hope that was shared with the whole council. Um, 
downtown's really at an inflection point and there's a lot of excitement um, and I think that we can really use this as a, a tool to catalyze a lot of development that we've been talking about for years and years and years, long before I came to Montpelier. But we're talking about having the ability to do some, some major uh, progress towards our goals in terms of affordable housing, in terms of economic development, um, in terms of downtown parking that's been talked about for, what, four decades. Um, and I, I really think that, um, that, that we have this opportunity to just have another tool in the tool belt. There'll be plenty of opportunities for public comment. There'll be review of every project. There'll be votes on the bonds. Um, I think it's really important that council uh, moves forward and, and just gives themselves this tool that can catalyze change. Thank you. Okay, any other thoughts? I yeah. just want to <coughs> add that um, I don't know the right protocol, but if there are any granular questions as this goes forward, we want to make sure you're as comfortable with, with the material and the, the plan itself as you can be. Um, when the state comes to review this, they want to know that it has the full understanding of the municipal body that's approved it. And so if there are any grant more, more specific technical questions like Rosie had, so I file them through you, I suppose, yeah, sure. and then I'm happy to answer any of those types of things. Through us, actually. <coughs> Sue or I. There we go. I met, yeah, for yeah, but yeah, so um, because my hope is that we'll be able to provide you with the, the final plan and come back for approval in two weeks. Great. All right, well, thank you, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to this, and I think this is going to be a great tool for us. So, thanks. thanks. Yeah. Is your presentation going to be on the website? Sure. Good. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Can be now. <laughs> The Scribner Street right of way. It's it's we have received uh, some emails about. Oh yes, Donna. I'm sorry, it's we hit the two hour mark. Can we have just sure. a short break? Sure. Uh, like like a break? five minute break? Yeah. All right, so I guess I'll, I'll uh, call us back to order here. Um, all right, so if, uh, if Maggie, and if, if you'd like to come on up, I'd love to just get a really brief uh, description of um, the situation, and <coughs> then, and then, and, and Tom, if you want to come as well. Um, sit here, or just yeah. Well, you can do either. You could stand there, stand? or stand wherever you prefer. Yep. There's mics in either place. Well, if Tom's coming up, maybe we should all. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you think that's the idea? I don't understand how these lights work. I, I am Maggie Neal. Hello, Hi. I live on Script Street up at the top, number eight. There used to be a number 10 a long time ago, but I am at the top at this point. Um, it's a very small parcel of land, a piece of wild land, less than a quarter of an acre that has been very dear to me for 23 years. Um, it's a tough hill street to climb in the winter time, but it's been worth it to have this land. And I've been protected on this small acreage by a vast acreage of 14 acres around me, owned by number nine. And it's been wonderful to have all this wild land so close to Montpelier, so I could be uh, an artist and work for the arts in the community for the 23 years. So, ah, been pleased to be part of Montpelier. So in the last year, things changed on the hill and it became very unsettling. Uh, there was a waterway that came down the hill from an upper spring and it was disturbed and moved. Um, we didn't understand why this was happening, so we uh, talked to the number nine neighbor, and he said, well, it's my land. And he said, oh, when I bought this piece of property, I thought that my eight rods were all along the whole length of Scribner Street. That's what the deed said. Um, at least Scribner Street 
when I spoke with Tom, it seemed there was no definite designation of where Scribner Street ended. So there's a real question of, do I live on Scribner Street or, <laughs> or what? At this <coughs> point, it has really changed. Um, I would like to appeal to this council to set a designation of how long Scribner Street is. I would like to see it be 340 feet from River Street, which would include my front yard and my driveway as part of the easement of Scribner Street, rather than belonging to a private individual. Um, what can I say? <laughs> There's so many questions. I just, I don't, I'm not one who wants to live with anxiety, and I have felt great anxiousness in this situation, and it's, it's affecting my life, it's affecting my health. So it seems like little peanuts compared to what we were just talking about. You know, these big money and this tax and, you know, it's, whoa. Uh, all I want is to know that the street in front of my house is a public city street and that I have the access to my property that I've had for 23 years and that I'd like to give to my son without any entanglements. So. I probably could say a whole lot more, but I know there's going to be a little red card that comes up. Here, so. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't tell me the time. Yet. <laughs> oh, that's, that's true. That's true. Well, I feel like we've yeah. talked so long tonight, yeah. or others have. That. So, <laughs> Tom, would you mind explaining the, the process from here, or or Bill? Uh, just sure. So, um, the agenda template explains um, the recommended action and provides background information. Provided a uh, memorandum and some attachments. Um, everybody received that and have an opportunity to review it. Um, so unfortunately, um, in this situation, our the city's lack of, of proper records or the town of Berlin's, if it were annexed and it became a street for that, has really resulted in this anxiety and uncertainty, which is unfortunate. Um, as I said in our memo, it's um, important for all property owners, including the city, to know their boundaries, and um, and most of our streets and roads. In fact, that's one of the jobs I first took um, when I started here many years ago was to survey right of way. So much to my dismay, there was no official record of of a right of way for Scribner Street, and uh, nothing in our files. And then we hired an, uh, a surveyor to search it further. Um, Maggie's friend um, also did quite a bit of research. Um, I spoke with uh, an attorney, Paul Gillies, who has a lot of background in this. Um, and unfortunately, um, we're at this step where a lack of official action um, is, exists in this case, and we must correct that. And state statute um, provides the, uh, the action to be taken, which is described in Paul Gillies' step-by-step uh, -step procedures. Um, the, the meeting tonight is to, to give a general overview of, of the situation and, and where it stands and why this is necessary. Um, and then to, under the action, is to set the date to begin that actual process, um, the legal process under the title of 19 VSA 33, uh, subsection 33. Um, just briefly under that section um, in the in the statute, um, survey of existing highways. The for the purpose of this, that the the word survey means the survey of an existing highway where no no previous survey has been properly recorded, or the record of a previous survey has not been preserved, or the terminations in this case and boundaries of a previous survey cannot be determined. That's the conclusion that we've come to. A resurvey is to produce a previous survey of, or surveys. We can assume that one was done. We just cannot locate it for whatever reason. Um, whatever the outcome, whatever this is, either a survey or, or a resurvey, the procedure is the same. To um, looking at Paul Gillies. Um, 
recommendations, I asked them to prepare a step-by-step -step procedure. Um, so that's what the statute says and what has to be done. Um, then how do we do it all? Um, so there are notice provisions. Um, I did under for this uh, particular hearing a briefing, um, uh, which was duly warned. I sent a letter to all the known property owners. Um, so that's that's this process. It wasn't a required piece. You've done the warning, um, but the rest of it is um, uh, laid out in statute. And so we have a 30-day advance notice of the hearing. Um, and I have, we have to um, notify the owners, lenders, utilities, and those with easements. Um, we have to, have to set the date of a site visit. The council must physically go to the street um, and view it. Um, there is a hearing, and the hearing is, um, um, we will take testimony, you'll question me, uh, speak with the property owners, uh, any evidence that they wish to present, to support the case um, that it is in fact a public street and um, or any evidence that may be available to help us the City Council determine what its true length is um, Maggie mentioned a length of 340 feet that is the crux of the matter what is the length um, there are highway maps for um, under this under the state requirement for certificates of highway mileage which we still do annually every February um, indicates 340 feet um, the surveyor indicates that that her entire frontage is along the street which is 396 feet so um, so in the in the background information in the memorandum um, that is the the information that we need to know is to complete the research the surveyor that I hired um, did a review of the records, uh, both here in Montpelier and in Berlin, um, had previously surveyed Maggie's property, so it, was, it made sense to use that surveyor uh, to move forward, and then uh, and did, uh, from that, uh, found that her description actually describes a border with Scribner on, on the westerly side, and so the what, needs to happen next is to complete this research of the entire street um, and all of the properties and see if we can find s uh, additional evidence to support that um, there's no question about um, and I do have a typo I wanted to point out in the background it says the City Council is asked to consider historic evidence of acceptance by the city through continuous and uninterrupted care and maintenance not interrupted so there has never been a period where where the care and maintenance of the street has has not occurred um, so our uh, my suggestion is to allow us sufficient time um, to provide the notifications which has to be, has to be sent by certified mail um, that we suggest June 13th um, for that meeting a regular council meeting um, this is going to be a time-consuming process because that is the, that is the prescribed uh, method that we have to follow um, there is a part in the statute um, that I think is important as an additional action uh, notice of the completion of the survey shall be sent to all known abutting landowners by certified mail not less than 30 days before the survey results are filed with the appropriate town clerk together with notice of statutory rights or appeal um, so that tells me that we should at least get the survey scheduled now or this is going to take even longer um, so really what the City Council will be doing um, and as Paul points out the survey does not have to be available at the hearing um, I think it makes sense to do that because you cannot take deliberative action until you have that survey and the results of her findings or his findings um, if that surveyor is booked out too far this we could be into the fall before we get this resolved and we really don't want to cause any more anxiety and concern about this so um, so if I could add that um, you can order me to issue those notices and to uh, retain the services of a licensed registered land surveyor to begin that survey process would you like a motion certainly and any questions and the other property owner is here if you'd like to speak uh, Mark or just listening 
Okay. Well, actually, I just I have a couple of questions. So first, what what I'm hearing, but I want to ask the question is that it doesn't sound like there's a dispute whether or not it is a city street. The question is how long is that city street and is it 300 and 310 feet, 316 feet, 340 something feet or 396 feet. That's really that's the ultimate issue here is how long the city portion of the street the is. The boundary includes the width and the length. Yes. Okay. Yes. So okay. we believe it to be well, I didn't check that. I think it's um, uh, two rods, 33, but I'm that all needs to be okay. resolved. And so, um, so the, the question is not whether it is a city street, it is how long Correct. that city street is. Okay. Um, and then my other question for you, I saw, I think it's your memo, yes. Um, the designation between a class three and a class four, I assume that comes after the determination is made as to how long the street is. I think it's the last page, so like last right. full paragraph. Yep. Okay. okay, so um, that's a great question. Um, so there are improved portions of a street um, and that is actually the eligible portion of the street that's eligible for state aid. Okay. Um, and what we see today in the current certificate of mileage is what I believe to be the improved portion of the street. There is a section, um, and certainly Bruce Sargent could speak to this further, it, I, I can't say whether it was ever improved beyond this. Mm -hmm. I believe it was actually laid out as a right of way beyond the improved paved portion. Okay. Um, but there's no way of knowing whether it ever existed uh, it's possible there were other properties accessed up there. Um, so we have not been maintaining that, and an unmaintained street could be two things. can be a class four, um, which the town is under no obligation to maintain, improve. Um, under that designation, you don't receive state aid for it. Um, there are minimal obligations, which is to... Um, address drainage primarily under statute. You may have heard about that, but a number of cases related to the town's uh, lack of diligence in, in maintaining drainage. Um, there is another option, and that is trail status. Um, I don't think that's appropriate in this case. Um, I think it is uh, the primary or a, a future access. I think you can always reclassify it as a trail later. So the recommendation would be to, again, subject to the outcome of the survey, is to classify that in the acceptance as a class three and then the remainder is class four. And so does that mean, and I'm not saying that these are the numbers, but it would be whatever number th this legislative body finds to be the length of the street. Right. So, so for example, the paved portion, let's just say that that's what we agree, not this is just hypothetically, mm -hmm. yeah. but so let's say we say fine, it's the 300 and the, the paved portion is 310 feet and then it, there's another 70 feet behind that and so what that what that ask in that paragraph says is that the paved portion would be a class three road and then the rest Next would be 86 class four. feet would be class four okay yep okay all still right of way all still city property but so just a class control. three versus a Correct. class four okay and we if we called it a class three and and then and submitted a new mileage certificate mm -hmm. we'd actually have to improve it to class three standards and those the standards would, that we adopted okay I think that was all that jumped out to me Im immediately, but. Right. You have another chance. <laughs> Rest assured, I will have questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, Marie Smart, no, I'm 6 Scribner Street. I'm Maggie's neighbor. When she got her uh, surveying done, I was surprised at the line. I assumed where my line was it moved. Uh, I'm concerned about my title search. This will be a survey of the, the street right-of-way. Um, research of the adjoining properties will occur because that needs to take place. It's all looked at together under the research. Um, but it's not a survey of your of your actual property line. Okay, so you need from us uh, uh, probably a motion directing you to um, begin this process to do the survey um, set the date, set the date for, yeah. for the June. hearing to take to consider.
consider the, the official action. And I think the thinking was we do the site visit right before the regular council right. meeting. Mm -hmm. and then have it on so the what site. time do you want to start? Well, you normally meet now at seven. seven. Um, so between the site visit, I don't think it will take too long. Um, it's really a viewing. Um, here's the beginning, here's the end. Here's Maggie's property, here's the neighbor's property. Just go 630? I, I'm thinking you'll be up there maybe 20 minutes. Um, 615. 615, yeah. yeah. 615. Okay. Do we have a motion? Uh, Although I can work this out. I don't think I need a uh, here an official motion to order the survey just to understand that, that I will begin that. That, yeah. that makes sense. So I would, so I think the motion would be then I would move that we commence the surveying process and that we set this for a hearing on, is it June 9th? Was June that the June 13th. 13th. I'll second. The site visit at 6.15 With, yes. and the hearing during the regular meeting. And that will be the, the warning notice that I send out at 6.15. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Uh, great. Um, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Great. All right, thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks. Okay. All right, so the tax stabilization application. While Fred's up. coming up, I'll just do a quick introduction of general re tax stabilization. We do have Voters have uh, approved tax stabilization in the city uh, for a maximum of 50% of the municipal taxes, this is not school taxes, for up to 10 years. The council in 2003 adopted a policy which I've attached, uh, which gave different levels of approval based on if you met certain criteria. Um, I think for most of you, you haven't, the only one you may have done was the Caledonia Spirits, which was tied in with the development agreement. This was actually more common where a de developer sort of comes to us with a project and says, uh, I'm requesting this and here's my story. And we take a look at their criteria, we weigh it against the policy and present to you. You have, you're supposed to hold two hearings or meetings to discuss it. I think the theory is you get the information if you have more, you want more information, have questions, then you can direct them to the staff or to the applicant, and um, then we'd come back at the next meeting and try to address them. So with that, this is Fred Connor from Connor Brothers. Uh, good evening. I'm Fred Connor, and I'm uh, here to represent the applicant, uh, which is a company that's owned by myself and my three brothers, Steve, Mike, and John. Um, we uh, are approaching our 30th year uh, as Connor Contracting and have been doing redevelopment work in the city for about 20 years. Uh, and I wanted to just touch on a couple of projects and then circle back to this application. Uh, we uh, have gotten word that the Montpelier Health Center, uh, which was previously located on State Street across from the uh, State House, uh, was being dislocated because the state wanted to buy the building they were in. Uh, so we uh, got in touch with the, uh, 150, the owners of 156 Main Street, which is the former Masonic Center at the Roundabout, and uh, struck a deal with them with the Masons to build them a new facility over at, uh, across from, uh, across the road from the uh, Civic Center, uh, Central Vermont Memorial Civic Center, uh, and then redevelop that property uh, for uh, the, the uh, Central Vermont Medical Center as, as, the, as the Montpelier Health Center. Um, so that's a project that we went into uh, with a tenant in hand. We had another project, which is this property, where we had a tenant in hand, which was Cabot Creamery. Uh, the applicant uh, purchased from the city of Montpelier that property, which had been put out for uh, votes for both police and fire uh, buildings prior, uh, and, and that was rejected by the, by the voters. They wanted to see those uses stay downtown. Uh, so the city then went out for proposal, and we uh, won that bid and brought Cabot Creamer to town uh, with 50, starting with 50 employees and going up somewhere in the 75 range. Um, so again, that's another story where we had a tenant in hand. Um, moving over to Stonecutter's Way uh, and working with very strong support by the city, we acquired the property next to uh, the, the uh, 
Pago Mountain Co-op, and we developed that property on spec. Um, and it is now the home of uh, the Office of the State Chance uh, Office of the Ch uh, Chancellor of the Vermont State Colleges, as well as uh, the Nature, Nature Conservancy. Um, so we've done uh, about a handful of projects, redevelopment projects that have substantially increased the uh, grand list and created uh, upwards of a couple hundred jobs. Uh, moving back to the application that's before you, uh, we've been successful in releasing the, the existing facilities to uh, Cascade uh, Technical Services, which is an environmental drilling and testing, and testing company, uh, and also CADCUT, which is an aerospace company uh, that also has operations locally in uh, uh, Middlesex. So I'm here bef before you tonight uh, to uh, request a tax stabilization agreement for this new building that we are building on the back half of the former Cabot Creamery uh, site. Uh, we have, uh, it's roughly a 15,000 square foot building, so we'll be roughly doubling the assessed value of that property. Uh, and we are in current discussions with, uh, I said in my application, one, one prospect, we've actually got uh, two prospects that are looking seriously at it, and uh, I would like to go to those meetings next week and tell them that the city council has weighed in and has uh, supported the maximum uh, allowed by your regulations. Uh, which is a half uh, half off for 10 years on the municipal uh, taxes. Uh, in order to do that, we would be requesting the same. We would be making the same request that we did at Stonecutters Way, which is to have a one-year deferral of the uh, benefits accruing to our company in order for us to demonstrate the the jobs. So we did that at Stonecutters Way. I think the minimum is 25, and there's roughly uh, 50 or 60 people at that location, uh, and we would like to have the opportunity to, to uh, demonstrate. We know we demonstrate uh, level three benefits. We'd like to have the opportunity to show that we benefit, that we uh, can demonstrate that we meet uh, level four requirements for the for the employment. And again, this is a, a twin to Stonecutters Way. Uh, we're, uh, we want to take it on a, on a speculative basis and uh, then get the building filled. So, I'd be glad to try to answer any questions. Dear Rosie, um, so my biggest concern. Um, would be that um, a business that was currently downtown would move out of downtown to this location. And I would not want to poach jobs from the downtown area. Um, even if in the course of that you added, you know, 25 jobs, 25 jobs out there is not as good to the downtown businesses as having the rest of those jobs downtown. And so I would be much more comfortable supporting this if we had some assurance from you that it, um, you know, the tenants that you were looking at were not uh, locations that, companies that were currently located within the downtown area of Montpelier. I would be glad to uh, accept your concern as a, as a condition of the approval. Other questions? Uh, so I, I have um, a couple of um, questions. Um, so, and, and actually one is about the, um, the, the levels. Um, so one of the things that I, that I'm interested in, and I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm in, I just want you to know, I'm, um, planning on supporting this and, um, want to see this go forward. Um, one of the questions that I, that I have is about, um, again, the kinds of jobs that we um, bring into Montpelier. And I know, you know, your, your letter referenced, you know, bringing quality jobs to Montpelier. And one of my definitions of quality uh, is, um, is, is a livable wage. And so I know that, you know, that you as a developer are different than um, whatever the tenant, um, whoever the tenant would be. So don't necessarily, um, I'm not sure that I, we can require anything in terms of livable wage of the tenant, but, um, for, for the future, I mean, one of the things that I might want to see about um, uh, thinking about for the criteria for this list is uh, are, are these uh, livable wage so jobs? The yes. policy actually calls for that. Oh, it does, okay. For, uh, to get the top level, uh, it has to, I'm reading it right here, so the project will result in a net increase of 25 full-time 
equivalent jobs which pay at least a livable wage oh, okay. for a single sorry, person is calculated. So that is okay, the so requirement. It's, it's so they have to okay. make that representation. And okay. That we, they provide a re the annual report. The, the building owner provides a report, but the information is provided by the tenant. So that's a condition. I assume it's a condition of the lease if they're passing along savings. To okay. Great. Thank you. I'm sorry. I missed that. I'm, I'm, I'm maybe a little confused, and maybe I read this differently. I, I mean, it says thought it said the project doesn't currently meet that and that's why it's a third level rate now. oh I think, right. so the so the the issue and I think that's what mr. Connor's proposing here is that they don't have a tenant so they can't they make can't a representation that. that they have these jobs so he's asking for the approval for the top level but deferred for a year to give them a chance to certify that they've reached that and I, that's what and he's I think correct the way, that I that's think what the way we did on his way the way it was handled last time is we actually reapplied or we came back in to see the council and said um, here's the new tenant we'd like you to welcome and here's what his with their job situation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we actually had to come back in to get correct to get the, those level four benefits yeah. 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 I think the way I drafted the proposal here was that you could award the level three benefits because I think it qualifies for those defer it and provide them the option of coming back to seek to upgrade it to level four okay. for a year. And I, I guess, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. I really raise my hand. <laughs> I apologize. Um, so one of the questions we just heard about how Montpelier is working towards being net zero in, you know, in, in hopefully our lifetime. <laughs> um, and so I'm curious how this construction project has factored any of that in. I mean, as a city, if, you know, we're in essence being asked to expend funds and it's not really an expenditure, it's just a not generating the revenue, which means that there's no, I mean, we're, we're in essence losing money because we're, we're allowing for the abatement for that period. Um, what sort of, like, what sort of information can you provide to the council about the environmental impact of this construction and, and how that meets with our net zero goals? Um, we, uh, by the state energy code, have to um, execute a very um, uh, strict adherence to those codes, both building envelope and mechanical systems uh, and lighting. So we, uh, and, and we're uh, rewarded by efficiency Vermont for some of that, but most of it is to uh, for bragging rights to the t to the tenant to be able to show them when a lease renewal comes up that they've been, they're they're in a building that is very cheap on energy uh, relative to other other structures and we've had tenants tell us that that this is you know it's half over what it was where we were on a square foot basis and and that's how you it, 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 that's how you keep the tenant is to make sure that you have a very high efficiency equipment and a very good building envelope. Uh, what are you planning on heating it with uh, fuel oil? This would be propane. Propane. As an aside, not, not, well, I can't wait. I have a comment about the policy that's not related to this application. So I can, uh, <laughs> um, yes, Glenn. And in, in that direction, uh, for net zero, efficiency is great, uh, and production is also usually part of it because the building is always going to be using some energy. Have you considered uh, any kind of solar or other energy generation uh, as part of? this construction? Uh, we have, the roof has been, been uh, set up with a strength to be able to hold a, a solar system, but we have not gone forward with that. So it has the potential? Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, Ashley? Is this something that you would do with or without the tax stabilization from the city? Can we even ask that question? <laughs> but. The, the, the decision to do the job, uh, which involved a lot of engineering and site permitting, et cetera, uh, was made knowing that you have this tax stabilization policy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and, and all, as I tried to point out in the application, our, our, our tenants pay the taxes, whether it's Montpelier Health Center, it's the, you know, whether it's the hospital, or whether it's the state of Vermont or the Nature Conservancy, they, the tenants pay the taxes. So what we're able to do with your incentive is win tenants. And if I could bring you one of these a month, I'm sure you'd be glad to see me. <laughs> and I ha we haven't been able to be back in about five years, so we're pleased to have the opportunity to be back. Other questions? Yes, Donna. So you made the building so it could hold solar, but you wouldn't do that? Your tenant would do that? The tenants pay the electric, so it would be up to the tenant if they wanted to execute that project. 
because I would encourage you to put it up there so they would use it and benefit from it. It's also a sales tool, right? It, it could be. We definitely have to work on this criteria. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I, I, I mean, if we're going to change the rules, I certainly don't want to, you know, um, <laughs> uh, burden Fred with that right now. So, <laughs> but yes, Donna. So, if I understand right, the motion would be to approve Connor's brother's application for level three table. Oh, we don't even need to do that. At don't this even point. need to do that. Right. Okay. You know, this is your first of two meetings. So you'd actually make the decision at the next meeting. This is your chance if you want more information to come back. Okay. Um, if you don't, great. Let's put it on. Um, Rosie. I don't think we officially opened this as a hearing. Oh, well. So we'll for open this it to right be the now. First hearing. I think we need <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, so we're opening first. First hearing. hearing. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. So I, I guess I will say one of my concerns is, and I, I said this the last time tax stabilization came up, and this is a different project, and I. I, I'm treating this as a different project because I think that having more, you know, office space or, you know, light industrial space, I mean, that's a, it's a different request than the, than the last tax stabilization re request we were presented with was, but I guess I'm concerned because I don't, I don't see a tenant list. I don't e we don't even, you know, I, I know that people have talked to you about it. And I guess for me, what I am looking for is to see like who those employers are, you know, are those the kinds of businesses that Montpelier would want to be investing in? Because this would be an investment of city dollars through, you know, through the, through the non, through the abatement period. Um, and, you know, I, I agree that they're not in town developments, but that's not to say that having employers out of town, you know, who are who are generating business for this area is not something that we should be investing in. I just would like to know more about those potential employers. And I know that, you know, you, you guys have done great work here in town with the businesses that are here. Um, I'm just concerned that we don't sort of know anything about any of those prospective businesses that would be getting taxpayer money and, you know, as a as a resident here who doesn't own a home because of whatever economic circumstances are at play, um, you know, I think that asking our people to spend their taxpayer dollars on something that we're not quite sure about um, it is concerning to me, at least in this regard, because I want to make sure that the jobs that we are attracting to Montpelier do pay an actual living wage and not, you know, the 13 something an hour that the state says is what it costs, because anyone who lives here knows that that's, it costs way more than that to be here. Um, and so I realize it kind of puts you in a bit of a predicament because these have just been, you know, potential people. But if you had anything at all that you could bring back to us, uh, you know, about even inquiries for the, the type of industry or anything like that, um, that might assuage some of my concerns about that. It's just, you know, I, I don't want to be spending people's money or, you know, abating taxes for businesses that, that are sort of hypothetical at this point because, you know, the, the facility obviously isn't built yet. but. Um, I just, I, I think in order for that to, to be a vote that I could vote in favor of, I would need to know more about those prospective employers. I, I think your point um, ties into uh, Councilor Bates' point about what, what we're asking for. We're asking for level three, and we're saying we have to come back and demonstrate to your satisfaction that we have uh, the caliber of a company and, and the employee pay, pay scale that, that you're looking for. And I guess, so, and maybe... This is a question for the city. I mean, so the the half would be the level four, and then it's a, it's a lesser percentage from there. Right. There's well, there's a table of what range of, of sort of combination of either less time with the same. So I'm trying to find the actual policy to help you through that. There's each level has a range of awards that can be. Thank you. Thank you. So, okay. uh, and it, you, you can okay. see the, the different Two. ranges that could that qualify. So it could be a lower percentage for a longer period of time or a higher percentage for a shorter period of time. Um, I'd suggested the one half of the six years, which is kind of right in the middle. a half from five to seven years or a third for eight to ten years. What's the range? Um, yeah. While we're asking 
questions of the city uh, on that question of living wage jobs. Uh, what number is are we using to determine the, the living wage? Um, State. It's, it's, the, it's there's, in there. there's a it's indexed to. Uh, okay. But it is, Ashley, you said it is the state numbers. It's, I think it's, it's like calculated 13, as state of Vermont joint fiscal office. Okay. Uh, Jack. Um, I haven't digested the policy multiple times yet. Um, if, if someone, if an applicant satisfies the uh, criteria, is the applicant entitled to the abatement or is this purely discretionary? It's discretionary. discretionary. The, the, the goal is to have the guidelines of the criteria of the expectations. Yes, Rosie? I would just, I agree that I think this policy could use some work, but I also don't want to, you know, change the expectation for an applicant midstream. So I agree. Uh, there's a lot of things I would like to see in this policy going forward. Um, I think we've all had some conversations about that, so um, I would encourage the staff to move forward with helping us with that. My family has been residents for 20 years, and uh, so I'm not, uh, I'm pretty knowledgeable about all the operations of the city and the fact that we have a ha high tax bill that goes along with it, but I can assure you that tenants, when they're looking at that, uh, who are non-residents, you know, they, it, it, is, it is part of the criteria um, that, they, that, they, that they certainly focus on. Okay, well, I think we should um, move on. So let's, uh, we'll, mm, do so we need to close the, the, we're gonna close close the, the first hearing, assuming hearing. that no one else has you comments. Can you the, 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 the public. Well, you have to have a second one. Right. But I think that yes. this would probably be the time, if anyone had concerns or reservations about approving this, I think we might would be, in fairness to the, I was just wondering applicant. technically whether you close the public hearing or whether you continue it to another close date. It, to another date, certain. Then you have another one. I think, I think we, we have, have to have a second public second hearing. One, right? Yeah, we have to set the second one and then we'll right, next, meeting. next meeting. And so uh, I assume we need a motion um, to set the second public hearing. I don't know if you have to. The policy just says there will be two. We, we okay. set this one without a motion. So we okay. Well, then, we'll, well, let's assume that we'll have a second public Let's hearing see. on this on May 9th. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you all for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And when is that next meeting? Uh, May, May 9th. 9th. Do we Great. need to actually Thank you all. Two weeks vote away. to close the no, I don't think so. Um, Hopefully not. So while, long while this is on, I d you know, I did want to note, and it sounds like some of you have reached a similar conclusion that you know this policy was written in 2003 and reflected high reflected <laughs> values <laughs> at that time, <laughs> and uh, it was something that I had actually passed on to the Development Corporation last year when uh, Joe came on and said, you know, it would be nice for you folks to weigh in since it's supposed to be attractive for development. It'd be nice to get that perspective, but also a chance for the council to put its values, so whether it's wage rates or types of, you know, jobs or environmental what environmental things that, you know, at the time, certainly, you know, protecting housing was a big deal, and that would continue. So I think that would be something we certainly ought to look at. The other thing, and it, we've danced around this and um, with every application, we require it, they have to have permits order to qualify but then we also say you wouldn't have done this project without this well to get permits you have to hire engineers to go through you know so it's every applicant is sort of caught in this position of trying to demonstrate a but for after having already invested in going forward and I think you know, I guess I'll say it on camera I think the, the council at the time just didn't want to do this and so tried to set up a So I think that's just it's, it's a, that's a tension point every time we look at this. And I think either we say that's it and you should do this before you get your permits, or you know another thing might be to set a couple of key criteria that have to be meet as barrier of entry. If you get to at least even get in the queue, and then after that, I, I think there's a lot of things, but uh, I certainly urge us to update this. It's been a while. Yeah. So let's on the list of things that we'll talk about maybe in our strategic plans. Right. Yeah.
Okay. Awesome. We are up to the public works presentation. There they are. <laughs> and they're still awake and alert and energized. <laughs> Thank you. Go as fast as you want it to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just I'm always worried when you so say that, no my friend. <laughs> Hopefully, we've gotten out a lot of our questions on the tours. Which are wonderful. I had allocated an hour. So we'll try not to make this too painful. You know, it's late. Um, Bill's checking the Red Sox scores. No worries, mine does. So good evening. Uh, I'm Tom McArdle. Uh, to my right's Kurt Modica, Assistant Director and City Engineer. Zach Blodgett, is our uh, Staff Engineer. And Corey Line, is our Project Manager and. So decided we would bring, um, I would bring my uh, support group. So this is a really a team effort in our office and, and throughout our department. Um, first slide is just a breakdown. We have uh, within, the, within the department, we have uh, five divisions and then we're kind of off to the side, City Hall employees. Um, so total is 36 and a half employees. Um, that jump. So I won't bore you with all of this, but uh, the support group that I turn to is, is a professional association called American Public Works Association. And uh, they're a nonprofit national organization, tremendous support for public works professionals and interacting training. Um, so public works is a combination of physical assets, management practices, policies, personnel, government, um, and sustained structures, services essential to the welfare and acceptable quality of life for its citizens. And I believe we are highly, we know we are a highly regulated profession with at least a dozen laws to comply with for just just the environment alone. The regulations grow across the economy every year. So we'll speak more about that as we move along. Um, so under under the public works, uh, we are um, really three pillars of sustainable infrastructure, which is what we are all about. Um, we are try to be good stewards of, of the of our infrastructure and the environment. Um, we ha are tasked with managing many, multiple assets, and we have to develop and prepare and, and uh, uh, use the financial planning to take, take care of all of those assets. So it's kind of a, a picture graph of, of all the various things that we take care of, uh, street signs, traffic signals, um, everything really, you walk out the door, this building, um, everything you look at, step on, um, drink, uh, everything, the roads is, is somehow related to public works management and maintenance. Um, we are um, producing about a million gallons of drinking water. Um, we treat about two million gallons of wastewater. Um, so annual. Uh, daily figures and uh, maintain the city stormwater systems. We operate a district heat system, um, extensive fleet of vehicles that you all saw uh, during the tours. Um, and I'm really grateful we were able to do that and take a look at all that before you hear me and, and this group talk so we know what it is we're talking about and, and, uh, and uh, what it takes to manage all of these assets. Um, we 
also have some facility maintenance responsibilities, this building as well as our own uh, facilities. And our group, um, we are administrative and engineering, and we provide oversight of all our divisions. We, we do the permitting, project management, we staff committees, um, we manage and oversee engineering studies, we develop operating and project budgets, uh, administer accounts, receivables, payable, department payroll, and then some. So it uh, keeps us pretty busy. Um, and so how do we make it all happen is, is um, responsible for operation maintenance. We have fleet management to take care of. And um, the way we do all this is we assemble a highly competent, dedicated, knowledgeable, and credentialed staff. Um, both Kurt and Zach are, are professional engineers. And we have licensed operators and um, in treatment facilities and, and licensed mechanics. So um, it does take professionals um, beyond the, the labor, um, it's, it's a top to bottom uh, performance. Um, we have uh, IT uh, skills and uh, you saw quite a bit about the SCADA system that we use. Um, we are involved in, in civil, several aspects of, of uh, engineering, um, civil uh, geotechnical, water resource, transportation, engineering. Uh, not much in structural, um, so there are fields of engineering that we do have to go outside of staff for. Um, as I mentioned, we manage projects, grants, studies, support construction projects. Um, so our operations first and, and maintenance, it's Primarily, our, our primary function is, is operating and maintaining our facilities and infrastructure. We have seasonal obligations in winter. Um, summer is obviously construction season for us, and where we do an awful lot of maintenance. And then we have a lot of year-round operations um, that take place. We'll do design work. We have fleet work, uh, CSO monitoring and uh, traffic sig signals is, is a, is a year-round operation. And we also do something that maybe some people don't know is we participate in the Dig Safe system, which is a great program. Uh, we mark, field mark our utilities to protect them for excavation. Um, administrative and engineering, we are, we are here to support the council and management goals. We, we provide development support, homeowner projects, um, issue permits, those that we administer and regulate. We provide site plan review. We support Montpelier Live, the recreation, parking, cemeteries, facilities, mapping, and budgeting. And this, we believe, is, is really important to know, and maybe a lot of people don't know, but, um, and Bob, Chief Gowan's just left, but we also believe we are. Um, always there, as, as the APWA model says, we're, we are always there, and we are first responders and the last responders. Um, emergency response includes floods, wind, snow, ice storms, water main breaks, um, anything that breaks, we're there to fix it. This is Gallison Hill in 2011. Uh, we were there for, um, and had a, a temporary road built, and we were there long after the, the emergency event is taking place. There's a lot of paperwork. This is particularly, um, this, this particular event was a federal highway um, under the e, um, ER program, emergency response program. So as you imagine, there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of, uh, a lot of design development, and we had the road back um, at a temporary road within a couple of weeks in the, in the project. A new culvert installed by uh, that winter. So. Um, so we take that very seriously, that we are always there 24-7, one way or another, we, there is a way to contact us. Um, I'll go through this briefly because we touched on a lot of it already, but um, you know, su stewardship is the, really the definition of super, supervising or taking care of. Um, and again, it's assets um, that touch our everyday life. Um, 
Our project management is from conception through completion. Uh, that is when we believe its projects work the best. It's if we get involved in the, at the ground level and are able to see it through to completion. Um, so project development and project delivery um, provide the engineering services. Uh, much of that is done in-house uh, now. Um, although we do and always will have to use outside consultants, um, there are permits and regulatory compliance. Um, a good example is Northfield Street Project, where we have both an op um, construction permit obligations and operational permits under stormwater. Um, so there's a lot of uh, evaluation that has to be done daily uh, for, for erosion prevention and uh, sediment control. Um, master planning and studies is, is really necessary to define projects, uh, to obtain funding support for grants, and it's a something that uh, some people say you do an awful lot of studies, conduct a lot of planning, um, and that is true. And but it is the ne very absolutely necessary first step in doing anything uh, to really define what you need to do, what you're going to, what you hope to accomplish, um, and then that leads to um, engaging the public early and often and throughout the project to completion. Is, uh, is a valuable um, and necessary part of what we do. And uh, it's time consuming, but if we don't engage early and often, um, we're not as likely to succeed in what we're trying to accomplish. Um, we'll move on to that one. You guys want to jump in? Um, and by the way, if you want to um, ask questions at any point, Go ahead, you don't have to save them to the end. That might keep you awake as well. <laughs> uh, so project uh, development timeline is uh, something that's difficult for a lot of people to understand what it takes to develop a project, and there's a lot of different things but um, that can influence and affect um, project delivery and completion. Um, but the first thing you do through those studies and, and evaluations is to um, define the project and you know what is the problem why did, why do we need to do it um, what are we hoping to accomplish and what we don't have here is oh yes um, is it is it a desired improvement or is it enhancement or is it a maintenance project um, again we talked about the, the feasibility studies preliminary engineering um, we have to identify the project constraints um, right away, environmental, uh, those are two of the, the big, uh, often time consumers, time drainers. Um, you never know where that's going to lead you, particularly on the right away side of things. Um, and it's always best to look at your alternatives. Um, one alternative that should be in every evaluation is a do nothing. And so you can compare the selected alternative to just leaving it the way it is and not investing at all. Um, there's cost benefit. What are the de maintenance demands? I think is a lot of it frequently overlooked. Um, it's only new for the day you turn the key over. After that, it requires maintenance um, and an ongoing maintenance commitment. So what is the level of maintenance that we're obligating ourselves to do? Um, the uh, shared use path is, is one such obligation where it's, it's another mile and a half of, of uh, path and, and we will be maintaining that asset um, for a long, long time. So think about that. Uh, materials, access, all of those things need to go into your consideration in developing your project. Um, final design, getting to the, and securing your final permits, you're bidding it, uh, that's the fun part, bidding the project. Uh, finally, after all of that, planning. And then you start scheduling. We are Vermont. We have seasonal limitations. Um, we have um, have to decide whether or not we're going to inspect the project, ensure specifications, contract documents are followed, um, or if we're going to use uh, somebody outside to do it. Um, give you an example of um, you know, three to seven years is not uncommon for project development. Longer if right away environmental permits are required. The Cumming Street Bridge, which will start this fall, uh, did have a right-of-way snag. Um, 
trying to secure that because uh, these projects do have significant impacts on, on people's properties. So that is why the right of way is so difficult to resolve. Um, but uh, Cumming Street was begun in 2012. We'll start construction in 2018 and finish in 2019. So that's pretty typical. These guys somehow managed to put together the Northfield Street project um, from conception design to completion next year in three years. So that was driven mainly by trying to coordinate with uh, the state paving project. Um, and uh, so we didn't have right of way. We, we moved through the environmental piece and uh, went pretty quickly. Um, so what drives or influences our decisions and, and how we move forward? We, again, we have the regulatory things that we have to consider, what are the policies and goals, the asset management piece, um, and our master plan recommendations. We have a few master plans out there now, now for, um, say, bike and ped, our water sewer, um, streets, um, environmental influences can divide. Um, uh, drive decision making um, and that might mean um, we do something now or differently um, and certainly public opinion what are the what's the desire of the community what is the preference of the community and under the regulatory world um, an example there is we have a, a water main master or water system master plan um, change change in regulations in serving fire hydrants uh, no longer allow six inch water mains. Everything has to be an eight inch. So that drives a decision. It may be a still a functional water main, but, but we have to allow that to, to drive our decision and get approval from the state on when we're going to, to make those changes. Um, CSO, Clean Water Act, Americans with Disabilities Act, safety improvements, all of those pieces in the regulatory world um, will impact our, our uh, or influence our decisions on, on when we do it and how we do that. Um, certainly uh, policy goals here, particularly at city council level, uh, the steady state infrastructure, our desire to reach 70 PSI um, for our roadways, um, public opinion um, certainly comes into play on, on things that they deal with every day, uh, roads, sidewalks, um, and, uh, you know, the service expectations we have uh, under the public opinion uh, side of things, um, even construction materials and aesthetics are, are things that, that are important to people. What are we, what are we building this sidewalk at? Is it asphalt or concrete? Walkability, um, bike friendly, again, all factors that we have to consider for making these changes um, or improvements. Um, you know, every street we pave uh, today is under the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, considered a, a substantial alteration, and so we have to, to bring everything into compliance with, uh, with current standards. So we are going to touch on asset management in a later slide, uh, but asset management is really what drives uh, our master plan recommendations. We use asset management to really uh, identify where our, our systems are and what the cost is, and then we then use that to make uh, long-term master plans. So there are ideal times when we should maintain or replace this life cycle, all of those aspects within the asset management, another influence that um, we should be um, paying attention to, such as resurfacing streets or, or applying a preventative maintenance treatment uh, before they get beyond um, that and require more, more money and more effort. So that's an asset management strategy, again, influencing our decisions. I think this is, uh, um, in fact, put this slide together and it's really, if I can find it on my sheet, um, it's very telling of, of, you know, just the breakout of, of where these funds are coming and how they're, but if you look at capital improvement on your far left, um, compared to the amount of grants we have currently outstanding and active, um, let's 
uh, it's small, but it's still a significant amount of money in the capital improvement plan. Um, over a million dollars is invested in, in, um, in how that, uh, in maintaining our infrastructure. And, but that also is used to uh, leverage grant money and match. So within that grant fund is, is $5 million on the bike path and uh, four for Taylor. Um, so there's significant dollars that are leveraged from uh, through the grant, grant program. And we have currently, um, and this is a little sad because we don't sometimes have to count them, um, 17 active grants one way or the other right now. A lot, several of them stormwater, a couple of, of shared use paths. Um, actually, a third of those have, have come out since since the Clean Water Act um, was approved. Tom, um, can you um, yes. spend a second talking about what, how does the staff time work on grants? Do you guys actively go after a grant or do you have a project and you say, okay, how are we going to fund this? What are the relevant grants? And then I assume you spend time writing them and I'm just curious how that all works or if, if you see a grant announcement come out and you say, what can we <laughs> mm -hmm. apply that to? I, yeah. So, um, you know, in all grants, no grant is created equal. They all have different requirements and, and application side of things. Um, I talked earlier about planning studies and master plans. Um, some of those stormwater things came from the stormwater master plan. Um, there were recommendations within those, within that plan to um, address chronic problems. I see the Clean Water Act as a um, uh, great for the clean water world, but having dealt with a lot of uh, disastrous uh, flooding events, um, this helps also to build resiliency. So we go after these grants um, for, for that side of things. So driven, guided by the master plan, personal experience or professional experience in, in, in dealing with some of these issues for a long time. A um, few of these grants we received uh, gained assistance from um, the Friends of Winooski. Great partnership with that uh, group. The Conservation Commission is getting involved in that. So there will be recommendations there um, and, and helping actually uh, with the grant application and a couple of them are doing that. Do we ever then we have the bike and ped master plan and a, a few grants related to that. Do we ever hire grant writers or do, do we do that all that in-house unless we have a partner? Well, uh, yeah, we haven't we haven't had to really, we did our grants the, are uh, that complex. Okay. We did get some help with the, the roof drain grant. Okay. Rarely we do any department can help. Okay. Um, a couple of the VTRANS grants are, are really quite uh, straightforward. Uh, they come out every year. They're very competitive. Um, the Class 2 Town Highway and the structured grants are uh, pretty straightforward. They've streamlined them. The state on those handles the environmental uh, side of things. So that's, that's kind of nice. And then the new stormwater stuff, uh, some of the new uh, grants that they put out are much easier than some of the. Some of the smaller stormwater grants, um, they've kind of designed so that it's much easier easier to apply for an application. And they're encouraging this, mm -hmm. pushing them. We get we get emails and requests. Uh, so this last application round, there was 350 applications that they had to review, and we did not get approved for two of them that we applied for this past fall. We've got a few outstanding. So I wasn't terribly disappointed. But, yeah. The planning department also. One of the grants that we applied for that we weren't successful in getting was a College Streets um, grant for stormwater uh, management because we're, we're paving that street this year and thought it would make a good match for that. So we did get some grants for Northfield Street uh, stormwater, which was a nice match because we're doing that project. And we had to deal with with some additional impervious area that we were developing. Corey's got a couple on uh, transportation alternatives program and heard a lot of saw a lot of inf uh, talk this this uh, over the winter about Barry Street um, and 
that corridor study that's taking place. So, going <laughs> um, to speak to that, Corey, and that whole. Uh, well, just in terms of the grants, the transportation grants, they're, they're pretty straightforward, and, and we really don't need to farm that out to anyone. Uh -huh. We take care of those in-house. Um, Could you get closer to the mic, Corey? Oh. Well, we'll just touch on the revolving loan funds. That's sold late for Northfield Street. Those are uh, state-administered loan funds at low interest. So um, there really is a, the city still has to bond for those, but we just sort of broke it out because it is a, a lower interest than what we can get on the, on the open market. Um, but right now, Northfield Street's our only current project that's utilizing those, those funds. But it is out there for both water and sewer. That's right. It's for utility improvements, so yep. clean water or uh, drinking water. Under the CIP for um, FY19, we'll talk about that in the next slides. Um, so it's a little more than a million dollars, but we also had under the under the bonds um, that was approved that were approved in March, um, a, little, a little more than a million each for water and sewer, and one for the. Uh, bike pad here, but also Taylor Street is included in that. Yeah, it was two $1.3 million bonds. One was for uh, this bike path for uh, Taylor Street and other infrastructure related work. And then the other bond was directly re related to water sewer. We also tap into other operating funds um, to help support projects. Um, so, and but just the, the overall package, this is, this is how it's all paid for. Other than grants, we do want you guys to notice that the sewer operating budget is by far the biggest operating budget within the city, uh, just over $4 million. It's a pretty big pot of our, um, our money. Uh, just as they were talking about earlier with the, um, the energy uh, presentation. So. Yeah, a lot of that it has to do with the septage and leachate receiving. That pretty significant revenue source for the city, which we're looking to build on with the project. We'll talk about next time. <laughs> May 9th. <laughs> yeah. We'll be talking about that on the, it'll be on your agenda. Um, so the importance of assets, and we have tracked assets, we have managed assets, uh, and so it's really uh, identifying what we're responsible for. Um, where is it? How old is it? What has to be done to it and how often? How much will it cost? When do we need to do it? How important is the asset and is it a priority? Um, we prefer that our approach to this is um, planned, predicted, and consistent um, and not uh, you know, reactive. Um, we have uh, been working on improving our developing and integrating uh, an asset management tool to help us with that. Um, and Zach um, has, uh, I don't know if he's going to just develop his own software or what, but he's, he's pretty skilled at this, um, working with the um, our existing ESRI uh, GIS mapping and using Manager Plus. So if we had time tonight to show you what he's done, it's, it's pretty, pretty neat. Uh, clicking on your asset, you can jump right to the next one on that. Um, so of all these, these are the, just the statistics of what we take care of, but within um, so some of the asset management program, for example, sidewalks really consist of you know, it's 24, 25 miles, but within that, there's 500 assets. Um, and water, like 4,000 4, assets within that. So there are water valves, there are fire hydrants, there's gates, um, pump stations. So that really doesn't tell the full story of, of what, you're, what we're actually managing. Um, and I think... Um, one that maybe people aren't that aware of is we have both for street lighting we have both a, an inventory of leased lights but we all Montpelier also owns uh, several lights in the downtown and on the bike path uh, roundabout all our city owned lights um, so go on to the next one 
So our projects uh, under the CIP plan, upcoming projects for the season, um, continue to work on Northfield Street. This is phase two. Um, we have in the bond a, uh, a slope stabilization project to complete on, on review. Um, quite a bit of work in that, that particular neighborhood down at the end of State Street. Um, the paving program for this year includes uh, Liberty Street, Sherwood Drive and College um, and Lagu. Um, college is from Woodrow to, I believe, East Hemp or East State. Yeah. Um, so all these are, are within that million plus of the of the CIP plan, the uh, pavement markings, crack ceiling. Um, then we have the Taylor Street project, some funding from that and from the from the bond. Um, we just got word on the um, on the shared use path. Um, Winooski um, East is um, from Granite Street out to Gallison Hill. That our uh, Act 250 permit is finally coming through, which will allow us to get our Corps of Engineer permit, and finally we'll get authorization to go to bid. So. Great news, big milestone, finally. Um, ready to go with that this summer. What's the yeah. pedestrian path? I know you've been saying shared use, but we still end up with bike path on a lot of places. Yeah, that was, that was my bad. Oh, <laughs> shame on you. But you have pedestrian <laughs> path at pool. So. Yeah, so that is actually something that we worked on with the recs department. The rec department. Mm -hmm. um, they needed to regrade their driveway, but it's really used as a pedestrian walkway. Um, is that the one that goes around the front? You uh -huh. Kind of, it's wide enough because it's, it also needs to be a fire lane. Yeah, yeah, because yep. trucks do. Yep. Yeah. Okay. We started it um, last year. It was going to be a simple paving job, and then we found some. It's it's not just for paving. We, so we put it off, and we'll just excavate it and replace it and do it right. So, um, so um, other th others, uh, stormwater work, um, a biggie that we're kind of excited about. I'm sure the school is and anybody on Main Street is happy to see we'll be replacing that water main <laughs> on Main Street finally. Um, so that has uh, been notorious for breaks. It broke on us again this, this winter. Um, so we'll finally get that taken care of. Um, and most of the work is all done on the Calistonia Spirits Project and the water main replacement. We talked about that a little bit. Um, the old water main on Berry Street, that's the first piece. The river crossing was done back in the 70s. Now we're up to up to the roadway. And uh, so we covered a lot of this. Uh, just some, some active projects that are going on, the, the actual grants, the design work that's working, uh, that we're working on in our office. I won't go through them all. You have the list, but uh, if you have any questions about those. Um, so we have a very full plate. Um, we've a lot, made a lot of commitments. We've in, in applying for these grants. There are deadlines. There are things we have to, there's quite a bit of reporting that we have to do. Um, and potentially another project when we talk to you on, on the 9th about the wastewater project. Shared that's use path two. What's Winooski East and what's the uh, what second shared use path? Uh, it's Winooski West, so that's the connection through the one Taylor lot from oh, Taylor okay. Street. Two separate projects. Yep. East and West side of town. Somebody came term? up with that in the planning office years ago. So, um, so uh, other. Other parts of this, um, you know, we do have new demands that come up, and we have to have some capacity to take those on. Um, we do have some, you know, we talked about the asset management when things should be replaced. Um, we have some things that are that are problematic that we have to move and bump up in front of other things. Um, so some some recent changes that we've built and, and tried to work into our. Um, management and with the existing resources that we have is uh, the, the heat district heat system the complete streets law um, and Corey and the, and the transportation committees are working on that 
Um, I see the climate extremes and our stormwater resilience, that, they, that is really a uh, thing that we have to be prepared for. And I talked about the, the use of the clean water funds and, and really developing some resilience. Um, we're our, we are a flashy town as far as flooding goes. That's one of the major, <laughs> major very flashy in a lot of ways. But <laughs> in stormwater world, um, it's, uh, they're flash floods. So we're very hilly, uh, steep terrain. And it comes down these, these stream channels uh, quickly and very erosive. Um, and so it causes a lot of problems. Um, so it's not, I don't worry so much about the main river, although that's a bigger threat in the winter or springtime. I, from our perspective, the, the stream channels that are flashy um, uh, are the one where we have the, the biggest problem. So we have the, the Clean Water Act, um, and we have the Municipal Roads General Permit that will have to be um, covered by this summer. Uh, I still haven't seen the permit come through yet, but that's coming quickly. I um, think we're in really good shape with a lot of help from the Regional Planning Commission on that. Um, the net zero is the policy um, that's, that's ongoing. Um, and now you heard about TIF tonight and the economic development support that uh, a lot of infrastructure development that, that we need to consider and to work into our, our operational. And, uh, so we have some, some impacts to our service delivery, some decisions that are made that, that benefit the community, but they do um, affect how we operate and what we have to do. Um, one of those uh, major ones is the, the winter event, um, the decision to have an event-based uh, parking ban rather than full-time. That we're, we're managing it, but it has changed how we go about our business. It, it really limits us sometimes. Um, just to clear snow banks off the street, we have to somehow get those cars off the street. So we're still not fully um, keyed in on, on how to do it well. Um, and it has been a, a major change for how we operate. Um, we understand the importance of it, the need for it, still haven't fully adapted to doing it right and doing it well um, with cars parked on the street. Um, we have um, diversified our staff from um, simply operation and maintenance to doing a lot more construction. Uh, it's uh, really a financial necessity. Um, a lot of things that, that we could do ourselves are very expensive to have a contractor do. So we do a lot of project support, or we'll do smaller projects all our, on our own. Um, again, we can design, get the, the water supply permits, and can build. Uh, Harrison Avenue was one such project. Um, and a lot of the work in the Review Drive, Gaylord, will be uh, done by DPW. So um, rolling that in, but also being mindful of the maintenance obligations that we can't lose track of. We got a little bit ahead of ourselves last year. Um, so trying to find that right fit, and that balance. Being construction um, is, is a commitment. Um, it's a necessity to make the master plan work really financially. Um, and, uh, we have the equipment, we have the staff, we have the engineering, the project management people to do it. So still working at it. Questions. <laughs> yes, you got to throw the questions. Uh, Rosie, yes. Um, so not tonight, um, but at some point, and it could just be a written update. I would be really interested. Um, we had our on our goals last year to get done the um, the low cost, high impact recommendations from the stormwater plan, um, and I would love to know where we are on some of those. But again, not tonight. <laughs> so low cost, high impact. The, that the big, low the low-hanging yeah. fruit right. on that, that, I read that whole plan, and I yes. was like, interested <laughs> in all of those, so. Um, and, and the <laughs> Conservation Commission, we just met with them the other night. Um, they're looking at that as well, so they're taking on some of the, about half of the stuff in that master plan is private property. Mm -hmm. um, so they're encouraging property owners. Uh, Friends of the Manuski is going to do a lot of public outreach. Uh, that's what they do, and they uh, really educate the public on that. So actually, along those lines, unless you had something you wanted to add, Zach? I was Zach? just going to say three of the active grants that we have now are 
projects that were identified as the low hanging fruit or moderate hanging fruit mm -hmm. on that. So on on that note, I mean, one of the things I was interested in is uh, in the email that you sent us. I mean, you got the the PDF of. Um, the projects over time that that you all are working on this massive spreadsheet of, um, mm, this, right? yes. yeah, that thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> and you know, I appreciate that it's broken down, um, but in the different sections. But one of the things that um, I I would find useful, and I think this maybe gets at Rosie's point, is uh, you know, from master plans like the stormwater, or from the Montpelier in Motion plan, there are projects that are identified. <coughs> Um, in in those documents, and where do they? I mean, part of me wants those projects to be fit into here somehow, e even if it's just as an um, aspirational, you know, because you know, I mean, that's a, that's a choice that a council would make to fund an right. additional project or not, and recognizing that that's in that's an increase. But um, you know, if if that really is a, something that we have as our master plan, it seems to me that we ought to be laying that out in. In the in this context, right? Because this is when I when I see this giant spreadsheet, this looks to me like the list of uh, all the things that you know more or less DPW is going to tackle. Um, is that is that an, a fair assessment? It changes, it, it, it evolves, but uh, sure. This is this particular spreadsheet is is the actual working document on how to fund each of these projects and where the money is coming from. Right. The old uh, spreadsheet that we still use um, is the, the there was a seven-year plan. This is a five-year plan. Um, is really the, the identifying what that project is, trying to come up with a dollar amount, an estimate, um, and but it's a placeholder so that it that it and so I hear what you're saying. That's 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 what it's for. That's yeah. what that's what a plan is for. And how you're going to finance it is, Corey. We were talking tonight about, um, you know, we really don't have some dollars. I got a lot of questions about what is this stormwater master plan going to cost. I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, same with the bike pet. Mm -hmm. Don't know. Mm -hmm. But start to break it out into some sort of yeah. logical dollar increments and, and put them out there. But realize that the that the most the most accurate set of figures is in the is in the first column. Everything else is oh, sure. a lot of a lot of. Uh, so one hypothesis is, is that you know, the Montpelier in motion um, plan should have its own section here. Um, another possibility is that those really should be um, divided up into the sections that they belong in terms of sidewalks or mm -hmm. um, um, uh, transportation. I, I'm not sure there's. Um, a anyway, lot of it, what is what funds it? So Montpelier Motion right. has a different funding mechanism than sidewalks. So sidewalks are generated through specifically the CIP sidewalk fund. So but you wouldn't fund something that was proposed through the Montpelier Motion and plan from the sidewalk fund? Like if it was could, a new sidewalk? It could be. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. It's, it's, it's so not just bikes. It's, it's I everything. guess what I'm saying yeah. is I would love to see that start to be built into this this graph somewhere either called out as its own section mm -hmm. or integrated into uh, the, the rest of it. Um, you know, if it's a sidewalk, then it's under sidewalks. Um, and and maybe even, you know, tagged with something like this is a part of the Montpelier in Motion Plan or if it's from the Stormwater Master Plan. I mean, I, does it belong under Stormwater? <coughs> pro pro probably. Um, but again... It could be as simple as just putting... WMC next to it. Or yeah, we have done that. There is yeah. a budget Corey does for the MTIC transportation infrastructure was group. Yeah, was we just so because part of my that. hope, um, you know, in, in um, you know talking through our strategic plan, uh, is thinking about how we are tracking those other documents and just to see where we are with those things. And even if we're not getting them done. That's obviously not the goal, but even if even if we're not getting them done, just having a tracking mechanism so that we know where we are with sure. them, um, I think would be helpful. So a, um, a lot of the and on the transportation side, um, specifically the Montpelier motion, it can be difficult to put it in a spreadsheet like this because a lot of it is dependent on grant dollars. 
sure. and not knowing if you're going to get those grant dollars. Right. It's, it's hard to put it into a spreadsheet like sure. this. Or what the actual cost yeah. and done some takeoffs and done the, the estimating. It's, like it's in the plan as um, as part of these larger projects. As we go pave a street, we look ahead and say, oh, there's a grant for this. Can we do right. this when we pave the street? So, so it's in there, but it's you're right. It's yeah. not called. It's, yeah. it's not called yeah. out, but, but complete streets like the ADA, like code compliance, it's an alteration, and we actually have to do reporting now say that we considered that um, uh, other modes of transportation mm -hmm. when, we, when we do. So we, when we pave College Street, we will fill out the review, and that's because we've done the analysis. We have the master plan that guides us. Another thing to think about um, is projects are frequently linked, mm -hmm. and we have to c keep those connections clear to us. Um, a water main project should follow, it's a critical path sort of thing. Water main project should follow the paving, not go before it. And if you're doing the sidewalk, um, you want to do the sidewalk, particularly with granite curving, before you pave it. So it's, we put them in different categories, but we can never, this one should follow this one or it should go with this one. So, but I hear what you're saying if we had those separate categories, I but then cross link. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, and I also want to respect that some of these projects that are in these plans are really difficult to uh, enumerate, right? Like how, how much are they going to cost? We don't really know. Um, and some of them, um, but I, w I guess I would assume that some of them we do know. Where we, there, there's a, a range or there's something that would be easier to guess. And then, um, anyway, just anything, anything to help us track that um, would be useful. Because one of my fears is that uh, if it doesn't show up on here, then it doesn't get dollars and it doesn't get done. Um, which I, I, I hear you that like, you know, you're doing the ADA thing and like complete streets and um, anyway, but, but particularly like with this, with the stormwater, so. Like if I can't see it, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I, I want to be able to see it <laughs> and know that it happened. I get you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Connor. Yeah, I was, uh, Tom, I was impressed on the tours. Like your staff, they're like Swiss Army knives, you know? <laughs> they, they could do anything. Um, but I, and I like seeing in the presentation um, that by like diversifying their duties, it looks like you might be reducing your reliance on contracting. And I guess the question is, is there any thought to actually increasing your staff as a cost savings measure to sort of further that? Just uh, yeah. yeah. for the next budget. Um, you saw all the nods, right? <laughs> <laughs> the increase really has been um, within engineering project management. Um, so we added a staff person um, this year in the budget. Um, we'll start July 1, um, who's an engineering um, recent graduate. Um, so he's a good field person. In fact, under Northfield Street, under project inspection, that, that one project of $3 million over three hundred thousand dollars in project inspection services that are being done, being done by um, Zach and Ryan. And, and so and we had, and we brought in a retired guy to help us too. So from that side of things, um, you know, we're always going to need contractors, bigger contractors that specify or um, specialize in, in heavy construction. So, so I, I think we'd be at a limit. Um, you know, it's, if we lease an excavator, we, it really doesn't make any sense to own one and have it sit in the barn. So, um, but I hear what you're saying. I appreciate that. I, I think we're, we're kind of moving towards more of that. Um, oh, just an example of a, of a paving contractor adjusting the elevation of a manhole or gate valve um, for paving because you true up the, the surface, you level it all out, but you have to take care of all the hardware in the street. The prices we get for some of that work is, hey, we can do it ourselves for a lot less than that. Um, and we do, and we try to do that. So that's something we can do, we're good at it. Um, but it's a coordination piece. You know, we get their schedule, then we get a jump. So there's a lot of that um, that we haven't figured out. But yeah, I, so I, I do want to also just say that there's uh, Berlin, New Hampshire. Um, they have recently moved to HDPE, and they're doing, as HDP is a type of water main, um, but they are doing in-house construction as well, and 
they do hire out temporary staff seasonal only into the summer just to get projects done. Um, that is something that we would consider maybe in the future. Um, I would certainly could do it. Um, you know, we don't have profit margins to worry about and stuff like that. We have we have staff to take care of. Now. So you're, you're, when we do that, we're not paying. All right, thank you. Thank you for yeah. sticking with it. Well, and likewise. <laughs> Stick around. We do a lot of work. Very grateful. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, so um, moving on to council reports. We have a pulled. Oh, we do have a. Oh, yes. Donna, do you want to. Donna, you pulled it. Uh, I did. I pulled agenda. the committee uh, t term time, timing of terms. And the staff recommendations are a couple are on the 15th of the month, one is on the 1st, one is on the 27th. And I either felt like we should do like everybody the 1st of the month and then make sure that the month before <coughs> it expires we're advertising instead of people's terms expire but they're still serving because we're late in advertising. And maybe the committee of committees wants to talk about this, I don't know, but it just seemed people should start the 1st of the month. Then everybody is doing May new on all the committees. I would suggest we refer this to the committee. Okay. okay. I'm fine with that. <laughs> I don't have strong opinions, other people. So, uh, gosh, what is our formal action there? Are we just, um, oh, we took, we, yeah, I was gonna say we pulled, we it, if we pulled it off the consent agenda so then. Okay, okay. Yeah. so we'll just bring it up for a future meeting, that's yeah. fine. Okay. Okay, great. And uh, all right, so now I think we're at council reports. So I forget where we started last time. I think we started over there. So we need to start, Rosie. Mm -hmm. I will pass. 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 Well, I went to emergency management training <coughs> regional planning commission, and it was wonderful. It was three hours. Sue was there, and I was asking Bill to get you everyone this booklet and this little hand. And it's really worth reading the slides. This is the whole slides to get an idea of what an incident command station is, what the flow of responsibility. It was very impressive. When you get those emails, try to grab a couple of those workshops. They're really worth it. The other thing, um, <coughs> we may have a special council meeting, but I am going to be gone. I fly out on Thursday, actually tomorrow morning. Yes, I knew this would be a late meeting and come back on Tuesday, Tuesday night. So I would hope if you end up with a special meeting for the farmer's market, it's Wednesday. Okay. All set, Mayor. I'll say again what I always say in council reports. I'll be at Open Hands Cafe tomorrow, 8.30 to 9.30, uh, to talk about anything that anyone would like to talk about. Last week, um, it was a great conversation. We talked about uh, transportation and trees, among other things. And Lynn Wild of the Tree Board handed me something to show everyone in council reports. Uh, photos like this one are going to be up in the Kellogg Hubbard Library for Tree City, which is a month-long exploration of Montpelier's unique trees. This one is my favorite tree in the city. It's the ginkgo uh, on <laughs> yep. Barry Street. Yes. Um, and it is incredible I think so uh, keep an eye out for uh, that display and other tree city uh, actions for the month um, and yes see you tomorrow at open hands cafe Christ Church Parish Hall 830 to 930 every Thursday uh, great so I um, just wanted to uh, mention that green up day again is uh, Saturday May 5th I'm pretty excited for that um, and then there's going to be a bio blitz in, uh, I believe it's in July, uh, with the North Branch Nature Center. So keep your eyes open for those things. And they're, they're going to be great. Um, and besides that, I have nothing further to report. Yeah. Oh, you just would want to mention, what do I want to mention? Um, that the meeting uh, discussing the potential of non-citizen uh, voting in municipal elections was bumped to May 1st, which is Tuesday. 
Um, so I just would note that we're going to have Dan Richards in there to, to talk about uh, some of the, you know, the, the implications in the context of Vermont. And also going to be Skyping in a fellow named Doug Chapin. He's got a really long thing of the Program for Excellence in Election Administration at the Humphrey School for Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. So he'll be there. Just dropping by. <laughs> John, will, will that be on ARCA? Um, I don't know. The other one was going to be. I haven't actually brought that up with, with this one. I almost have mixed feelings about it because ORCA goes to so many communities and it would be nice to keep the discussion here in our community. I would just love if there was a recording. I, I won't be able to make a meeting, but I would love to see a recording. Uh -huh. Well, maybe you can talk to those folks and see what happens. And, and, and that will be here Yep. next Tuesday. Um, so I'm jumping back in. Um, so uh, one of the things I just wanted to check in with you all about, I mean, I know we're going to have a lot of time in our strategic planning um, session to talk about the directions that we want to go, but one of the things that I think um, might have some traction is <coughs> the, the possibility of a plastic bag ban in Montpelier. And so I just wanted to check in with you all. Is that something that you're remotely interested in? Yes. 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 Okay. And straws. And straws. Okay. And yeah. straws. Great. Can well, I just um, yes. a shout out to Bev Allen, who uh, brought this up before the council. Did some work was very serious on it about, I want to say, 10 years ago. And a lot of folks I love on that council, but they didn't even give her the time of day. So it's great to, great to hear that it's going to be She's at least around. taken seriously. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. Well, tell her. Give her a shout out. <laughs> oh, well. Okay, cool. I just wanted to take the temperature on that. Thank you. Um, Red Sox four, Blue Jays three. <laughs> <laughs> Bru final. Bruins seven, Maple Leafs four, Bruins one, game seven. Um, more importantly, I, I only have one item before we go into executive session. Um, we are members of EC Fiber, which is a community internet service sort of based down at the Upper Valley. We've been members since the inception. Um, I think we've understood that it was unlikely we were going to be served by them if at any time soon, if ever, given the fact that we're not even contiguous with them, plus we already have a lot of service uh, and they're trying to reach the underserved areas. And, and as you know, we reached, recently joined C Central Vermont Internet. So a two-part question. One, the question keeps coming up whether we should remain a member. And I think that's probably a conversation that we shouldn't have right now, but I think we <coughs> should have it. I got a call from the chair of the board today. Basically, our terms, our, our representative terms are expiring at the end of the month, the month, and their bylaws say they have to be appointed before May 1st. So our current rep is John Block, who has not been attending. He's, he said he's been ill. Our alternate is Rob Chapman, who attends sometimes. I think he's recently moved out of the city. But this guy recommended, he said, just appoint Rob as your rep then if you want to advertise and replace him, but at least you've had a rep in time for the person and check with him and see if he wants to do it. Uh, and then we can take that up or have a conversation whether we even want to stay in. But if we were going to appoint him, we would have to do it <coughs> now. <laughs> or somebody else. <laughs> so unless anyone here is interested in being the EC Fiber rep. I know you suggest that we don't talk about whether or not we should uh, keep somebody on there, but I, I'm just as inclined to let that term expire. Yeah. Well, I, the question, well, that's, I'm not sure why we need to stay in either, and maybe we are just going to do this, but I would think that we ought to at least, uh, maybe not. Maybe <laughs> we don't need to have a full discussion of whether we stay members. And anybody opposed to just letting that lapse? There's no, I, I did speak with, had a long conversation with the chair today, and I, you know, I said, is it going to hurt you if we pull out? And he said, no. <laughs> he said we were helpful when it started, but they've got critical mass and they're going, and, you know, our folks haven't been that active, so it sounds like they could take it or leave it whether we stay. Uh, and I'm not sure what we're getting out of it. I think the one thing we may get out of it would be whatever we can learn from them, whatever CVI can learn from them. Right. How to do it, but that's really up to them to do. So, fine, I'll just tell them we're going. 
going to initiate separating. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? A lawyer will talk to them. Okay. Divorce lawyer. <laughs> okay. All right. And then we do have two items in executive session, which hopefully will be fast. So I move that we enter into executive discussion. How fast? I was going to go to the bathroom. Well, not that fast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to discuss the two matters. Yeah, and they're the, it's the real estate statute. Copy, so I can't quote it in accordance it. with yes. Title One BSA Section Three Thirteen Three Two. Beautiful. <laughs> I'm just going to put in accordance with statute. Real yeah. estate. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not Real one that we have to have. Are you s okay? Great. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. aye.